Hey my dear warriors, welcome to the one shot marathon of the most important chapter for your need physics. Many questions come in fact from this chapter of current electricity and capacitors which is a part of your 12th standard syllabus and you can expect close to 20 marks. Sometimes there have been uh, questions asked in such a manner that you might even get 24 marks in one single paper just because of these two chapters. So anywhere between 16 to 24 is what you can expect. So that means you need to really, really pay attention to this chapter. With me, Shreyas, your physics math teacher at Vedantu going live. I hope you guys are doing great. And do not forget to smash the like button and also hit the subscribe button. Hello, Levida, Suzan, Dogbrain, PSK. Nice to see you guys. Hi, Sachin. Hi, Susanta. Hello, Hamsini. Hello, Saja. Hello, boy. Welcome, Tarika. Good evening. Happy evening, Harni, Shafika. Nice to see you guys. Hello, Yamni. Hello, Asta. Good evening, Bachalok. Ready? Geared up? I hope you have done your daily routine of smashing the like button because it shows your immense love and support. Now, in this chapter, what we are going to, or in this session, what we are going to do, I'll tell you. We're going to start with capacitors and then we'll go to current electricity. It's going to be a big session. I have divided it into two parts. And there will be a small break also in between. After every subtopic is covered, I will give you some question which you will be solving. We'll solve it together so that you understand how the formula and the concept is applied. So it is more like problem solving plus theory plus definition plus entire, you know, uh, chapter is covered. All the touch points are being covered in this particular uh, session. Now, what is a capacitor? Capacitor is basically an energy storing device and it stores electrical potential energy. And it looks something like this. It stores electrical potential energy in the conductor inside of it. And you will see that the conductor carries some charge. So the moment you charge that conductor by some battery or some voltage, you will see those charges create a field and there is electrical energy stored inside such a device. So you need conductors. You need to charge it by some battery and energy is stored in the form of electrical potential energy everyone with me on this everyone with me on this first going with the high weightage topic Susanta. hello namaste ritija hi Priyakumari. hello is singh always always hello kirti hello gita uh, okay now this being said you uh, i'll just put up all the important pointers over here so conductors are charged the conductor is basically charged definitely and the energy stored the energy stored is in the form of electrical electrical potential energy there are many applications of capacitors like your camera flash your uh, radios your complicated circuits in tv fridge any chips or computers you will see will have some or the other uh, kind of capacitor now when I talk about a capacitor, you might be wondering what is a symbol. The symbol is nothing but two parallel plates. You just show two lines and you just connect them to two points, the terminals of the capacitor. That's it. So you will see the terminals of the capacitor being connected to two lines and you leave a space in between. That is the symbol of a capacitor. So let me just put it up over here. The symbol of a capacitor in an electrical circuit like this. Whereas the mathematical symbol will be capital C and you will see that whenever you have two conductors, this is one conductor, this is another conductor. If this capacitor has a charge of plus Q, if this capacitor has, sorry, if this plate has a charge of plus Q, this plus Q has come from this guy. I have taken some charge from here and put it here. So there is a minus Q charge over here. Such a device is now a capacitor, which is also now charged there is going to be electric field in between of them from positive side to negative side. So there is going to be electric field in between of them, definitely. And because of the electric field, there is also going to be some potential difference between these two conductors. Field always goes from high potential to low potential. So electric field is also created. And this electric field is going to store that particular energy without the field there is no energy stored inside the capacitor everyone yes yummy capacitors basically uh, store energy because of the charge i won't say it stores the charge it is not exactly storing the charge the 
charge is responsible for the energy all right now there is a relationship between this charge this voltage and the value of the capacitance and it is very simple q is basically equal to c into delta v this c is basically called as capacitance this is basically capacitance and the unit of capacitance is one farad in si so one farad is when you store one coulomb of charge for a voltage drop of one volt so one farad is the si unit of it hello kv santosh hello subhash everybody with me on this clear o understood o can we move ahead so q is equal to cv is the take away formula for all of you excellent now always remember whenever you have a capacitor there is some charge stored on one side another equal amount of charge on the other side the total charge will be q plus minus q which will be zero but when they ask you what is the charge on the capacitor they are referring to any one side of the capacitor either this side or that side the magnitude of it so whenever they ask you what is the charge on the capacitor they are referring to the magnitude of the charge on any one of the conductors so which is equal to cv delta v or just q okay now what does this capacitance how much is that capacitance what do you think it depends on it depends on how it is constructed what is the shape of it is it spherical is it cylindrical is it a plate or is it some other thing what is the distance between them so basically the geometry and the second thing which the capacitance depends on is the medium that means are you filling some water in between the conductors or is there air in between them or is there some kind of a ceramic in between them so these things decide the capacitance of the capacitor we are going to see some types of capacitor also in a bit but what it doesn't depend on is the charge and the voltage this is very important a lot of people say if voltage increases capacitance decreases that is wrong if voltage increases charge increases if charge increases voltage increases charge does not affect capacitance voltage does not affect capacitance is the other way around capacitance decides the charge or the voltage understand that because capacitance is a property of that capacitor so it only depends on the geometry and what is filling inside that capacitor and not on the charge or on the voltage alone i am very good yep i'll try to do emi also hello gopika thank you so much exactly good evening krideshwari yep do we need to remember the cgs units no definitely not okay and by the way the entire pdf will be available to you in the telegram channel make sure you download it asap after the session is over the link for joining the telegram is there in the description box that's where you get all the important updates and notifications so make sure you are a part of it okay so when a capacitor is connected to the battery what do you think will happen do you think a current flows in the circuit for some time and then goes down to zero or do you think there is no current which flows in the circuit or do you think there is an alternating current which flows in the circuit or do you think a constant current flows in the circuit let's see how many of you can answer this i want every student present out here to answer each and every single question if you want to score 20 marks in the neat examination just from these two chapters so as and when we proceed you will see slowly we are doing 8 marks then 12 marks then 16 marks and 20 marks so all the chapters are slowly going to build up your marks in the neat examination so let's see how many of you can do this guys d is that so i think most of you are wrong about it it is a who was it priya kumari said option a lakshmi said option a and uh, who else nobody else out there okay so yes yes it is option a i'll tell you why see that is why you should attend my classes right that's the reason why you guys are attending over here because you know you're going to make mistakes and you're going to learn from it and you're not going to repeat it so when you connect a battery of voltage v to a capacitor what happens is initially initially the current begins to flow the current starts to flow because it starts to flow because the capacitor is not charged yet it is not charged yet so because of that what will happen the potential difference takes the charge from here and puts it here takes some charge from here and puts it here so you will see after some time after some time you will see this battery is supplying current and you will see some charges getting built up over here maybe there is a positive charge here and an equal amount of negative charge so there is current flowing through it and charges are building charges are building up they are building up understand that the charges are building up slowly on the conductors of the capacitor 
after some time after some time what happens after a long time you will see or maybe some small amount of time you will see that the charges will have accumulated would have been stored completely on the plates of the capacitor there is no further flow of current there is no further flow of current in such a case the capacitor is just said to be charged guys so the steps involved are as follows there is no charge the voltage difference immediately supplies the current as the current flows the charges begin to build up on both the sides of the capacitor after some time no further charge is required it has got charged it has got charge that means there is no further flow of current electricity that said there is no current and you will see that the current stops so there is current and the current stops so hence the answer is option a current flows in the circuit for some time and then goes to zero everybody understood give me a thumbs up and smash the like button oh uh, sir my annual exam ends on friday what should i do before beginning with 12th uh, physics uh, well narin you can put up the uh, question probably in the comment section i'll probably try to answer that because then or else i'll deviate from the topic awesome sanju sweetie so glad that it's helping you and you're loving physics the session is going to be quite long awesome moving on to the next question let's see if you guys can answer this the total charge on a capacitor is 0 cv 2 cv cv by 2 0 cv 2 cv cv by 2 what do you think it is come on come on come on come on my warriors come on think about it the total charge of the capacitor is going to be how much the total charge now when i say the total charge meaning on both the plates together so there is some positive charge here there is some negative charge if there is a charge q over here there is a charge minus q q means cv minus q means minus cv if i'm talking about the total charge that means the addition of both of them the addition of both of them will be a big fat zero yes cv and minus cv together will give you zero charge hence the answer is zero but if the question was not the total charge just the word what is the charge on the capacitor this word was not there then the answer would be b cv okay the charge on the capacitor will be capacitance times voltage so play of words understand read the question carefully don't be in a hurry or else you will make a mistake now there are three different types of capacitors that we are going to study for your neat physics or for your ncert or board examination obviously there can be many more types of capacitors but these are the most commonly used types of capacitors it's completely uh, the names are completely given based on how they look or how they are constructed the first one is basically called as a spherical capacitor because it is having spherical conductors so there is a sphere and another sphere around it the second one is cylindrical capacitor because there are two cylinders concentric one connected to positive other connected to negative and the third one is a parallel plate capacitor just as the name suggests two parallel plates besides each other one positive one negative that's a parallel plate capacitor now these geometries will uh, uh, will give you different different capacitances and their formulas are also very similar also and little bit different also so you will see the similarities and the differences of the formulas to find the capacitance the first one is a parallel plate capacitor looks something like this there is one plate here and the another plate here there could be some medium but for now let's take it as air this is connected to the positive terminal this is connected to the negative terminal you will see that there will be electric field which will be set up between the plates of the capacitor there will be a uniform electric field which will be set up uniform electric field which will be set up inside the capacitor this side will be plus q this side will be minus q and imagine the area of the plate imagine the area of the plate of this side is basically a and the distance between the two plates is let's say d if a is the area of the plate and d is the distance between the two plates then the capacitance of such a capacitor is given by epsilon not permittivity into area divided by d epsilon not a by d that is the formula so i'll just put it up over here for you the capacitance of a parallel type of capacitor is epsilon not area divided by d 
you can see that it completely depends on the area, the distance, the geometry, what is filling inside that means permittivity. So that's what decides the capacitance. Very much standard. Let's probably do a question on this. The capacity of a parallel plate capacitor depends on, come on my dear students, okay, come on, come on, come on. How to maintain timing in the examination? Very good question. I'll come to that probably in another strategy video. Right now, I'm more interested in the crash course, completing your topics for your, uh, you know, a neat examination as well as boards. And as soon as we are nearing most of the high weightage topics, that's when I will give you more strategies on how exactly to write mock tests. Right now, start writing mock tests. You will make a lot of mistakes. You will not be able to complete the paper. You will not understand what should be the strategy to attempt the paper. You will slowly get a hang of it. And then when you have attempted at least five to 10 mock tests, that's when I come in and tell you, oh, listen, these are the mistakes you're doing. Now this is what you should do, but hold on for that. Okay, so there we go. Option D is the correct answer. Now I'm very proud of my Neat warriors. Very good. Tarika, Bling, Priya Darshini, Wonderworld, Avesh, Sampath. Very good, Sana. Very good, Susant. Very good, Kirti. Very good, Prem. Very good, Libita. Asta. Very good, guys. Very good. Awesome. Because the capacitance depends on the type of the metal used. No. How does it depend on the, whether it's copper or aluminum? It should be a conductor. That's it. Thickness of the plate? Na, 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 na. It does not depend on the thickness of the plate. It depends on the distance between the plates. Potential? No, definitely not. Q is CV, but C is epsilon not A by D. The separation between the plates? Yes, it does. Next question. The capacitance. The capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is 12 microfarad. If the distance between the plates is doubled and the area is a half, then the new capacitance is going to be how much? Think. There is a capacitance of 12 microfarad. Now what you're doing is doubling the distance and you're also halving the area. You're making the area half. So you're cutting it. So what do you think is going to be the new value of the capacitance? So I think we should start with the basic formula. Just apply it and see what is the answer that you get. Come on, think about it. No problem, Suchi Mama happens. Are there any test series in Vedantu? Yes, there is a crash course which is going. You can just check out the link in the description box. Thank you, Gopika. Okay, come on, come on, come on. Thank you, Spipe out. Okay, uh, Rakshan for scoring 100 in class 12th physics board exams. I made a strategy video just few days back. Just watch that video, you will get a hang of it. Okay, let's see. Option D is it? Let's try to figure this out. First of all, the capacitance is given by epsilon naught A by D. Okay, now this is the old capacitance. I'll just put it as C old. Now, what about the new capacitance? The new capacitance will be epsilon naught, area is half, the distance is doubled, so 2 times of D. So this will become 1 by 2, this 2 also comes, and epsilon naught A by D. Interestingly, 1 by 2 by 1 by 2 is 1 by 4, epsilon naught A by D is this old capacitance, and we know the old capacitance is given to be 12 microfarad. So I just have to divide it by 1 fourth to get the final answer as nothing but 3 microfarad. That's it. Option D, yes. D for Dandanaran, D for Ames, Delhi, of course. Of course. No problem, Sandhya. Uh, you focus on your long-term batches and whenever you uh, are getting a free time or you are uh, saying that, okay, now I need to revise this particular chapter which sir has done, Make sure you take out some time during the rest of the day and watch the recorded class, maybe even in fast forward mode, that's okay. Perfectly fine. As long as you're attending it and maybe you can just mark your attendance after the session is over in the comment section. Sir, I attended the class. So I remember all the students who are even watching it as recorded, not just live. Come on, let's do this. Okay, now we have the next question uh, coming up, but before that, we need to see the two other types of capacitor. I told you there is spherical, cylindrical and a parallel plate. For parallel plate, it was epsilon naught area by D. Now the cylindrical type of capacitor looks like this. Forget all this nonsense. Okay. So here you will see there is an inner cylinder connected to one terminal, let's say positive, and the other terminal uh, is connected to the outer cylinder, which is negative. So what happens is because there is a voltage difference between the inner cylinder and the outer cylinder. 
inner cylinder connected to example positive, outer connected to example negative, you will see that the electric field will come from the inner to the outer cylinder, something like this. So you will see basically a radial, radial electric field. There will be a radial electric field between the gap in the gap of that capacitor. And then when you try to find the formula, the derivation not there, not important. The final formula for capacitance comes out to be 2 pi epsilon naught. Instead of epsilon, it is 2 pi epsilon naught. Length of the capacitor. This is the length of the capacitor. Please note this out. This is the length of the capacitor. Okay, divided by log of ln means log. Please understand this in case you have forgotten mentioning it over here ln of x means log of x to the base e log of x to the base e that's what it means big radius by small radius big radius by small radius this will have some radius this will have some radius ra and rb so that's it that's the formula guys which you're supposed to remember 2 pi epsilon naught times of length divided by log of big radius by small radius Abhi, i don't know it might be more than two hours okay Cool. Electrostatic will do it later on, bacha. Okay, first I'm going with high weightage. Remember that? I promised you first high weightage. Yes, yes, yes. So I'll come with electrostatics also. Yes, I'm going to come with electrostatics also because it is also high weightage. Don't worry. Okay. Now, the last type of capacitor. The last type of capacitor that we need to know is called as a spherical capacitor. Spherical capacitor. Now, the spherical capacitor is nothing but two concentric spheres two concentric spheres inner surface is positive or negative outer surface is oppositely charged so in that gap between you will see there will be a voltage difference created because of the charges one positive one negative will create nothing but an electric field something like this so again there is a radial radial electric field which is created because of the oppositely charged conductors and then when you again try to find out what is the capacitance of such a thing it comes out to be now for cylindrical it was 2 pi epsilon naught just like when you find circumference so like a cylinder 2 pi epsilon, 2 pi r so that's how i remember it is 2 pi for a circumference of a cylinder okay or a ring but for a sphere when you calculate area and all that you will say it is 4 pi r square right so that 4 pi number comes with sphere area of a sphere so i remember for capacitance of spherical type it is 4 pi epsilon naught and there is no length or anything involved here you just have radius here you don't even have logarithm here you have the big radius and the small radius just that's it you subtract both of them that's it so 1 by a minus 1 by b so make sure that this number is always positive Many people uh, forget or think that, oh, is it 1 by B minus 1 by A or 1 by A minus 1 by B? But you don't have to remember that. See, just make sure that this number is big, this number is small. This fraction is big, this fraction is small. So the denominator here should be smaller. The denominator here should be bigger so that this ratio becomes small and the answer comes out to be positive. So that's all you need to remember. Okay, everyone with me? Clear? Like for example, just let me give you an example so that you are very, very clear. So say for example, C is equal to 4 pi epsilon naught and 1 by something minus 1 by something. If I have the numbers like 2 and 3, 2 and 3, where will I put 2? Where will I put 3? 2 is smaller, right? So I'll put 2 over here. 3 is bigger, so I'll put over here so that the ratio becomes small, this becomes big. So now this becomes a positive number. Clear? Understood? That's how this has to be done. Now, now, there is a special case, there is a special case of a spherical capacitor, that's when, that's when you will see the outer surface is not there, it's just a single capacitor. Basically, it is called as an isolated sphere. Isolated sphere is also, is also a capacitor, is also a capacitor, meaning you just have one sphere of certain radius r and let's say that has some amount of charge. The other, other sphere is not there only. Then you'll be like, sir, how is that a capacitor? Think about it this way, guys. The electric field lines which originate here, they do not end or terminate anywhere close by the end at infinity. 
so it is as good as saying so it is as good as saying that the other sphere is basically at infinity because once they start they continuously go out 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 outwards they never stop just like they stop or end abruptly over here no that is no ending so it ends at infinity so why not think of it as if there is a big radius of infinity exactly so then this capacitance this capacitance for such an isolated sphere for such an isolated sphere will become 4 pi epsilon naught 1 by r minus 1 by infinity but wait a minute i know what is 1 by infinity 1 by infinity is nothing but a zero it's a big fat zero 1 by a very large number 1 by a very large number is going to make it small so i'm just left with 1 by r so r goes on the top so it will just become 4 pi epsilon naught r 4 pi epsilon naught r this is also a very important outcome of this particular formula many times you might be asked questions on just a sphere's capacitor so it comes by assuming an another sphere of infinite radius perfect prim exactly maxwell it's a dc pande objective that you should use for solving many objective questions for neat okay so let's go to the next uh, question uh, calculate the capacitance of a cylinder whose length is 10 and has inner and outer radius as 1 and 2 centimeters respectively let's try to do this question okay come on everybody use the formula in case you have forgotten the formula here is a quick recap here it goes capacitance of a cylinder type of capacitor is 2 pi epsilon naught length divided by log of big radius by small radius so let's see if you can use it because it is a cylindrical type of capacitor so for a cylinder for a cylindrical type of capacitor it is 2 pi epsilon naught l divided by ln big radius by small radius now 2 pi epsilon naught i can write it as i can write it as 4 pi epsilon naught divided by 2 reason is i know the value of 4 pi epsilon naught that's why and uh, next thing that i will write is length the length is how many centimeters 10 centimeters so it is basically 0.1 meters divided by log of big radius by small radius big radius is 2 small radius is 1 keep it in centimeters because it is a ratio so dimensions won't sorry units won't matter so it will be 2 by 1 now the next step will be 4 pi epsilon naught guys what is the value of 4 pi epsilon naught Come on, 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught, everybody knows. 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught, everybody knows is 9 into 10 to the power 9. So, 4 pi epsilon naught will be reciprocal of that. So, it will be nothing but 1 by 9 into 10 to the power 9. Now, this will be 0.1 of course. And this will be nothing but log of 2, which is basically 0.67 uh, uh, and all that. Alright, that's what you can do. Everyone with me on this? Clear? So, that's all you have to do guys and uh, you will get the answer yep so sorry po not 0.6 and 0.69 my bad so 0.69 and solve this and see what is the answer that you are getting you should get it close to 8 into 10 to the power minus 12 so approximately you will get it close to 8 into 10 to the power minus 12 farad that's what it is hello lavia good evening when cylindrical capacitors uh, are there for boards I think it should be there just check it out okay okay moving on to the next one coming up on your screen the capacitance of a metallic sphere is 1 microfarad if its radius is approximately how to calculate ln value oh you should remember the value of ln how to uh, you should remember the value of logarithms certain logarithms like ln2 is approximately 0.693 ln10 is basically 2.303 so certain logarithms you should know 2 3 10 that's it more than enough if it is something else then they will give you the value of it in chemistry also you remember it right for the chapter of solutions and all that ph value acid is acidicity basicity right so you will have to remember it for physics as well as chemistry Okay, the capacitance of a metallic sphere of this much, uh, of how much radius is 1 microfarad. So, first of all, I understood that this is a concept of isolated capacitor. 
isolated capacitor think about it this is isolated capacitor so capacitance is 4 pi epsilon naught into r is that right okay now capacitance is how much it is 1 microfarad so 1 into 10 to the power minus 6 4 pi epsilon naught is 1 by 9 into 10 to the power 9 and this is radius so radius will be take these people over here so 9 into 10 to the power 9 and 10 to the power minus 6 will make it just 10 to the power 3 meters but the answers are in kilometers also so this will be 9 kilometers 10 to the power 3 meters is a kilometer so that's the answer guys it should be 9 kilometers for getting 1 microfarad that's crazy okay yes i have also conducted a session on logarithms definitely you should watch that in case you have not watched that okay cool uh, so let's move on to the next one. Let's move on to the next one. Okay. Now, what about the energy stored in the capacitor? Like I started my discussion only by saying the capacitor is nothing but an energy storing device. Okay. It's nothing but an energy storing device. Jerry PUBG, let me tell you, no problem like that has ever come in neat and it will not come in neat. So that is just, you know, useless thing that you will learn. Uh, finding an unbalanced Wheatstone's bridge equivalent resistance. It will never ever come in neat examination, at least for the next foreseeable future. Even in J mains, it has not come. So why will it come in neat, number one? Even in J advanced, they hardly give such kind of a question. Okay, so don't waste your time in such things. Only learn balanced Wheatstone's bridge. Now, like I told you, the energy stored in a capacitor is in the form of electrical, electrical, potential energy not just that I am also saying that the electrical potential energy is stored is stored in the field in the field of the capacitor or field between the plates of the capacitor the field between between the plates of a capacitor that's very very important it's stored always in between of them because that's where the field is and the value of the energy stored in it is given by the value of the energy stored inside a capacitor is given by half c v square which you can also write it as like this i write c v square as c v into v so c v is nothing but CV is nothing but charge, so charge into voltage. That's one way of looking at it. You can also write, you can also write the voltage because Q is CV, because Q is CV, I can write voltage as Q by C. So V as Q by C. So then it will also become half Q square by C. So all these forms are the same, but depends what is given and what is not given. Either you remember Q square by 2C, or you remember half CV square or you remember QV by 2. It's one and the same. Just like you have power formula in case of resistors I squared R or V square by R or VI. It's just the same thing in different different ways. Or centripetal acceleration formula V square by R or omega square R. It's the same thing. It's just what is given and what is asked. That's all. Okay? Clear? -o? Understood? That's how you find the energy stored in a capacitor. Now, there is one more formula. There is one more formula which you might need it very rarely, but just giving it to you in case such a question comes. And that is basically energy density. Now, what do you mean by energy density, guys, is the question. What is the meaning of energy density? The meaning of energy density is how much energy is basically there per unit volume so unit wise it will be how many joules of energy is there in one cube of the meter so in this volume how much energy is you know pressed into that how much is basically put inside that volume that is the density of the energy so that energy density comes out to be half epsilon naught electric field square a very important formula again but very rarely used is the field if the field is strong e is higher the energy stored in that volume is very large if the field is very weak then the energy is going to be very little per unit volume if there is no field at all 
E is zero, then there is no energy at all. So is it right for me to say that since the field is there only inside the capacitor, hence the energy is always stored inside the capacitor and not outside? Yes or no, guys? Yes or no, guys? Because the field always exists within the capacitor, that means outside there is no field, hence there will be no energy density at all. Hence, the entire energy is always stored between the plates of a capacitor. Okay, yes, the symbol of energy density. What is the normal symbol of density? Rho, right? The normal symbol of density is rho, right? But since this is energy, so density of energy, so rho u. Generally, they use this symbol rho u. Is that okay? Perfecto, perfecto. Let's move to a question coming up on your screen. A 2 microfarad capacitor is charged to 100 volts and then its plates are connected to a wire. How much heat do you think is produced? So you have a capacitor, it is charged. Now you take that capacitor, you discharge it by connecting the terminals. There is some heat loss. There is some heat loss which is occurring. So this is basically a charged capacitor. This is a charged capacitor. You are discharging it by connecting the terminals. Let's see how much heat will be produced. So whatever energy is stored in the capacitor, the energy stored in the capacitor will be completely lost as heat because the capacitor gets discharged. So this is how you use the energy stored in the capacitor. Remember capacitor is an energy storing device, you want to use it, just take the terminal connected to some appliance or electrical device, you will see that energy will go off into that device. So in this case, it is going as heat loss. So energy stored is half C into V square or Q square by uh, 2C. I think because voltage is given and capacitance is given, I'll use this formula or else I would have used, or else I would have used other formulas. Instead of CV square, I could have used this also and that also. But in the given question, it is voltage and capacitance. So therefore, therefore, that heat loss will be half capacitance, which is 2 microfarad into voltage. Now micro is 10 to the power minus 6. So I'm just going to put 10 to the power minus 6. Voltage is 100. So 100 square. 2, 2 cancels. So 10 to the power minus 6 into 10 to the power 4. So this is going to be 10 to the power minus 2, which is 0 0.01 joules. 0 0.01 joules. Yes, option C for Captain Shreyas. Perfect. That's the answer. 0 0.01 joules. And I can see many of you have answered this correctly. Some of you probably made a mistake by answering it as D. Maybe a decimal mistake. See what went wrong. Okay, but some of you have answered option C like Maxwell and so many others. Very good. Jolin. Excellent. Very good. What is the difference between capacitor and battery? Very good question, Abhinandan. What do you think is the difference between a capacitor and a battery? I will give you many. Number one, capacitor stores the energy in the form of electrical energy. Capacitor stores, you can write it down also shorthand, okay? Or you can replay this same statement. Don't worry, it is not going to go anywhere. Capacitor stores the energy in the form of electrical energy. Battery, how does it store? It stores in that chemicals, right? So it's usually in the form of the chemical energy. First difference, got it? Okay, second difference. Battery, you will see that it always has fixed terminals. This is positive, this is negative. Capacitor depends, however you charge. You charge it like this, this will be positive, this will be negative. You charge it ulta, that's it. This will be negative, this will be positive. So the terminals can be easily interchanged. Whichever plate you can make it positive or negative. Another difference, when you use a battery, you will see the voltage supplied by a cell remains the same unless it dies out completely or when it is on the verge of dying out. But the battery always supplies constant amount of voltage and in case of capacitor, you will see the voltage is not constant, it dies out, dies out rapidly and the graph or the equation is also, you will see uh, such that you will uh, see that within few milliseconds or microseconds only, the voltage decreases or even increases if you are charging it. Another difference that you will see is that battery can store a lot of energy for a long time. Capacitor, unless it's a very big thing, you will not be able to store a lot of energy. It's generally used to affect the electrical characteristics of a circuit. So usually the capacitors around you and most of the devices are very small. They store tiny beanie pieces of energy. Is that okay, Bacha? 
let's move on uh, uh, mohan raja i have already mentioned all the topics which are required for scoring more than 120 marks okay in neat physics so make sure you check out that video it's there just few days maybe few weeks back i had made that video okay i don't want to repeat the same thing it's a seven minute video just if it helps good evening aishwarya hello puja ji yes looks like you guys are a little bit late make sure you're on time so that you do not miss all the fun that we have okay uh, just leave a comment if you cannot find it but i'm pretty sure you are very intelligent to find it just go to videos not live videos Go to the videos tab, just scroll, you will find 120 marks, 7 minutes video. Next is dielectric. Next is dielectric. Yes, like Zeno diagraph. Now, a dielectric is nothing but a non-conductor or an insulator. Okay. And it gets polarized when electric field passes through it because of which the electric field strength reduces imagine a charge creating electric field imagine a charge creating electric field that field is going everywhere in space but the moment it enters water or rubber or wood or some material the material gets polarized and because of which the field reduces how much does the field reduce that is decided by the dielectric constant of that material. So you will see that the field inside any particular medium is the field in free space, which is E0, divided by K. This is basically your dielectric constant. Dielectric constant. If I say the dielectric constant is 2, that means the field will become half of the older field or the outside field. If I say it is 3, that means it will become 3 times less as compared to the normal field. Is that okay, Bacha? Waiting for my English lectures, definitely. I got a shock of my life. Suddenly, I'm like, English lectures? I'm talking in English only. No, okay. Okay, I understood what you meant for CBSE. Yes. Tamil Namaste. Vanakam, Vignesh Viki. Okay. Now, the next thing that you should know, the next thing you should know is... What happens when you put dielectric inside a capacitor? When you take such a medium like wood, water, there are plates, you pour that water or you put that wood inside the capacitor, what exactly happens? The moment you put it, the moment you put it, you will see the capacitance like this will increase k times. I'll tell you in a simple manner, for a parallel plate capacitor, for a parallel plate capacitor, what was the formula? It was epsilon naught A by D, right? What if the inner medium is not air, it is water or wood or ceramic or some plastic. It will have some dielectric constant, some value of K, correct? So, what will happen instead of epsilon naught, what will you be putting? Epsilon naught into K. So, that modification needs to be done. Only then you get the permittivity of the medium. Epsilon naught was permittivity of vacuum. Into K will give you permittivity of the medium. Yes or no, guys? epsilon naught into k i just mentioned that over here this epsilon naught into k is the permittivity of that particular medium this is permittivity of that medium so in general here is what i will say in general is what i am going to say is the new capacitance is the old capacitance multiplied by k times whether it is parallel plate cylindrical or spherical doesn't matter if you fill the complete material inside with some constant the capacitance increases k times k times exactly okay i hope this is very very clear awesome awesome uh depends prem kumar if magnetic field is constant or not so it depends on all of that okay so that relative refractive index uh, generally, we use root of mu r and e r's product, relative permeability and permittivity into root. That's the formula that we generally use. Okay. Now you might be wondering, sir, this is okay if the material is completely filling. Often you get questions where the material is not completely filling, but partially filling. Maybe this part is filled with air. Maybe this part is filled with glass. Maybe this part is filled with water. 
so multiple materials are there for each segment then what do you do simple logic this formula you will not find in many books this is my formula short trick formula a lot of people end up remembering sir when the dielectric medium is not completely filled when there is an air gap then the formula is epsilon d minus t by k it is very confusing no don't try to remember all those things i'm going to give you an easier formula let's say this is d1 let's say this is d2 let's say this is d3 d1 d2 d3 i don't know whether you can see d3 so maybe i can just use a different color this is d3 okay so these are the uh, distances of each layer you can say and then you also have dielectric medium over here this is k1 this is k2 and this is k3 okay i hope you guys can see k3 if you cannot see k3 wait let me write it down using a different color okay this is k3 is that okay guys perfecto awesome awesome Awesome, Anu Gome got full marks in semiconductors. Wow, very good. Practicals done, 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 dusted. It's time for theory. Uh, is this chapter uh, okay? If I remember just the formulas, Mohan Raja, I doubt. No, you should remember the formulas, definitions, etc. as well. Okay, now the capacitance in such a case is given by you put epsilon naught, you put A. Here, instead of D, right, what will you put is D1 by k1 plus d2 by k2 plus d3 by k3 if there are more layers you add more terms that's it if there are two layers you put two terms so this becomes easy and remember the dielectric constant of air if there is an air gap it is one this is such an easy formula than remembering other complicated formulas so please keep this formula in mind and not the other bakwas formulas yes if different dielectric is used then that's all. You put K1, K2, K3 accordingly. That's all. If different dielectric is used, then the value of K will be given to you. Whether it is 2, 3, 5, 5.7, whatever that value is, that will be given to you. For air, you remember it is 1. Okay? Hello, Deva. Okay, great. Let's move. Hello, Harish. Yep, let's solve some questions, guys. Coming up on your screen. Imagine a parallel plate, capacitor, condenser is the same thing. Don't get confused is having capacitance of 50 microfarad in air in liquid like oil it is 110 how much is the dielectric constant of that oil 0 0.45 0 0.55 1.10 2.20 everybody should be able to answer this and i'm waiting for everybody's answer come on everybody try to answer this question very easy i think i just told you about this the new capacitance is always the old capacitance multiplied by k so k is basically the new capacitance by that old capacitance in that liquid it is 110 in the air it is basically 50 so how many times will it go 2.1 or sorry 2.2 2.2 no not b guys see if you made a mistake it's not 50 by 110 it is 110 by 50 so the new the one in the medium upon the one in air so this is the one in oil and this is the one in basically your air or vacuum. So that's how it goes. Yes, option D. Perfecto. Excellent. Very good, Jolin. Sampath. Livita. Tarika. Asta. Very good, Anamalai. Very good, Sampath. Very good, Nishant. Kudos to all of you. Moving on to another question coming up on your screen. Wow, we have two layers of dielectric. This layer is D by 2 distance having dielectric constant 1 that means like air this is some slab again half the distance constant 2 question is what is the net capacitance i just gave you the formula when there are multiple layers so just stick with that the capacitance will be epsilon naught area divided by d1 now by k1 plus d2 by k2 that's the formula that's all you need to do so what is d1 d1 is basically d by 2 k1 is nothing but 1 plus d2 is again d by 2 k2 is nothing but 2 so this will become epsilon naught a d by 2 plus d by 4 which is epsilon naught a half plus 1 fourth is 3 fourth so 3 d by 4 4 goes on the top so 4 epsilon naught a divided by 3 d so i think that should be the answer many of you are saying option a very good guys Option A is correct. 
Awesome. So Vina, I'll be going to English for a few days because you have your English paper in the next few days. I'll be training you for English also. Yeah. So English channel, we have to train you for English also. No, who else? Physics teacher only will teach. What else to do? See what days have come. How to find those slabs are in parallel or in series? Okay, simple Abhinand. Uh, Abhinandan, I'll tell you, very easy way of finding out whether it is in series or parallel. If you have slabs like this, there is a slab here, there is a slab here, there is a gap over here. And then you have slabs like this. Okay. Now, whether it is in series or parallel, how do you understand? Imagine if current flows like this, just show the direction of flow of current. You see one slab after the other, one slab, then second slab, and the same, the same flow of current is there, same flow of current is there, then basically it is in series. Basically the current is nothing but same. Whereas here, what will happen if the current comes somewhat goes here, somewhat goes here, somewhat goes here, and again they collect over here, correct? So basically if it gets distributed, if it gets distributed, then it is basically in parallel. Is that okay? Very easy. Here you can see the current is flowing through the first, then second, then third. So one after the other, that means series. As simple as that. Yes, definitely entertainer 077. That's the whole point of subscription. Okay. Now, let's go to the, what is this? What do you think this is? Look at these capacitors, how they are arranged. Like an army of aliens. What is this? This is combination of capacitors. These are capacitors in parallel. This is capacitor in series. The actual photograph. You can see one terminal, second terminal, third terminal, fourth terminal. All terminals are joined to the same side. These terminals are joined to this side. And all the capacitors are in parallel. Because if you apply positive here, negative here, positive here, negative here, same voltage difference. So the charge will get distributed in all the capacitors. Exactly. So some charge will go here, some charge will go here, some charge will go here, some charge will go here. It will get distributed in all the capacitors. They are in parallel. You will see the voltages across them are the same. Number one. Number two, over here, this capacitor is connected to the next one. Next is connected to this one. This is connected to this. This is connected to this. So they are in series, one after the other. You will see the charges on all of them will be the same when they are in series. So coming back to the combination types. So these are capacitors in series. Just like for resistors in series, the current flowing is the same. For capacitors in series, the charge on all capacitors, the charge on all capacitors is basically the same. The voltage drop may be different depending on the capacitance, may be different. That's very, very important. That then the Total capacitance of series, a lot of you might be like, sir, is it C1 plus C2? No. In fact, it's quite opposite of resistors. So that's the tricky part. So 1 by Cs is 1 by C1 plus 1 by C2 plus so on and so forth. That is the formula that you're going to use for series. Exactly opposite of resistors. Okay, exactly. Just like springs. When springs are in series, their equivalent is exactly given this way. So it behaves like a spring and opposite to that of a resistor. If for two resistors or two capacitors, sorry, for two capacitors, for two capacitors, what happens is 1 by Cs will be 1 by C1 plus 1 by C2, taking LCM C1, C2 and C2 plus C1, that is 1 by Cs, therefore Cs will be C1, C2 divided by C1 plus C2. So you can use this formula when you just have two capacitors, but when you have multiple of them, then you have no such formula, you have to uh, solve it properly, okay? I hope this is fine. This is for capacitors in series, which has same charge, maybe different voltages, but their equivalent is opposite to that of the uh, resistors. Same thing has been given. For parallel, for parallel, what will be same? It's the voltage drop, which is same. Voltage drop is basically going to be the same. Is the charge, which basically gets distributed. The charge gets distributed. So the total charge will be Q1 plus Q2 plus so on and so forth. If this has charge of Q1, maybe this has Q2, maybe this has Q3 charge. So the charge gets distributed in all the capacitors. In such a case, the value of the equivalent capacitance in parallel is like 
resistors in series. So it is C1 plus C2 plus C3 and so on and so forth. So that's the formula that you're going to use when capacitors are in parallel. So parallel capacitors are easy to solve because you just have to add their capacitances. Okay, understood or clear? Okay. Uh, Anubhumik, I will not be probably there in the pro subscription obviously because I am on YouTube right now. So you will have other teachers who will be conducting strategies, guidance and all kinds of sessions, not me. Okay, so moving on to the next one. Okay, there are four capacitors, equal value. They have equivalent capacitance when in series. When in parallel, it is C2. What do you think is the ratio of C1 and C2? That's the ratio of the equivalent capacitances. Yes, Shahid, obviously. Okay, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, think, think, think. Think, think, think. What should be the answer for this? Okay, come on, guys. Uh, Anubhumik, I have already done the strategy sessions. There is no point taking strategy sessions every now and then, right? It is stupidity to take a strategy session every week. Well, there is, you should sit and study. So that is exactly what I'm trying to do over here. Okay, so four capacitors, equivalent capacitance C1 when in series, four capacitances when parallel C2. What do you think should the answer of the ratio of the capacitances will be? So when in series, when in series, the equivalent capacitance 1 by C1 will be 1 by C plus 1 by C plus 1 by C plus 1 by C, which is 4 by C. So C1 will be C by 4. That's the first step. When it is in parallel, then C2 will be C plus C plus C plus C, which is 4C. Hence the ratio, which is basically C1 by C2 will be C by 4 by 4C. So 4, 4 are 16, CC cancels. So 1 by 16 is the answer. Perfecto. Option B, B for Bombay. Excellent. 1 by 16, yes, Suji Mama, yes, Naveen. Uh, perfect, perfect, Livita, perfect, Jolin. Jayapriya, Sampath, very good Tarika, very good Shahid, awesome Susanta, okay, awesome, awesome, great. Hello Priya, alright. Now, moving on to the next one. We'll be having a problem solving session, Karthikian 11th, okay, uh, where we'll be doing even more problems from these chapters. Today, it's more focused on understanding the basics, the principles, the problem solving, just to get the hang of you know, capacitors. We'll be having more sessions. Not This is not the end of capacitors. Understand that. There will be problem solving sessions. A separate problem solving session just for electromagnetism. Okay. Just imagine this. Separate problem solving session for mechanics. Where we solve all kinds of problems. So that variety of problems. That variety and the models and the patterns is going to come in the weeks to come. Not days to come. Once we are done with the major high weightage topics. Okay. Cool. In the figure shown, what is the effective capacitance? Try to think about this problem. Come on, come on, come on. Think about this. How are we going to solve this question? These two capacitors are in series. Can you not see that? These two capacitors are in basically series. So are these two capacitors in series. When in series, what to do? 1 by Cs is 1 by C plus 1 by C. So basically it will be 2 by C. So Cs is basically C by 2. Okay, interesting. So this problem will boil down to something like this. The middle capacitor is as it is. The one on the side will be basically C by 2. The one on this side, okay, the one on this side is also C by 2. Now what are these three capacitors in guys? What do you think are these three capacitors in? They are basically in parallel, right? So C parallel is just the addition. So C by 2 plus C plus C by 2. C by 2 plus C by 2 is C. So C plus C is 2C. That's the answer. 2C. Where is it? Option A. Perfecto. Perfecto. That's it. So this is how questions come in capacitances. Okay. We'll be having a very short break of uh, around, uh, you can say, uh, 7 to 8 minutes or something like that and then we'll meet and we'll start with current electricity okay get ready for uh, current electricity in a bit we are just going to start with it and remember there will be many more sessions like mock test problem solving for many chapters which we are doing over here in the crash course it's not the end story of this chapter okay yes Kirchhoff's law everything is coming so what are we going to do after the break we're going to go with 
ड्रिफ्ट स्पीड करेंट डेंसिटी एंड मोबिलिटी ओम्स लॉ रेजिस्टेंस रेजिस्टिविटी इक्वेलेंट रेजिस्टेंस डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ रेजिस्टेंस फाइंडिंग वीट स्टोन्स ब्रिज पोटेंशियोमीटर मीटर ब्रिज देन यू ऑल्सो हैव पावर इन डी सी सर्किट्स एंड ऑल दीज थिंग्स यस ऑल दीज थिंग्स आर गोइंड टू कम के सी एल के वी एल सर्किट प्रॉब्लम्स ऑल दीज थिंग्स वे गोइंड टू डू आफ्टर द ब्रेक सो दैट्स अ बिग चैप्टर वेट फॉर इट जस्ट गिव एट मिनट्स गैप एंड वी आर गोइंड टू रिटर्न
All right. Ready to get set, go guys. Break is over. I hope you guys had some amazing snacks. What did you have? Just let me know. I'll tell you what I had then. Good evening, uh, Ashwita. A little bit late, but it's okay. Join in for the current electricity part. Watch the capacitors part later on. Equivalent capacitance by symmetry method, disguise method will come in neat. Uh, usually, they do not give such complicated things. Uh, disguise method only one two three important types of forms come number two symmetry also generally they restrict it to wheat stones and stuff like that that's all susanta is making tea for everyone thank you susanta much needed back everyone t plus sandwich oh my god lucky guy Piyush, uh, watch the remaining part later on let's start with current now yes uh, let's begin then i hope you guys have not forgotten to smash the like button come on do that and if you have any friends or your batchmates who want to learn this topic, you know what to do. Call them off to the Neat English Channel, the number one English channel in our country. So let's start. In current electricity chapter, chapter the first thing that we need to uh, understand is the topic of uh, current, current density, the field and the mobility and the drift speed and all their relationships. So when current flows in a conductor, the protons or the nucleus stays as it is intact. It's only the electrons which move. So you will see that the electrons keep moving from one side to the other side, but they are negatively charged. So if the electrons go this way. If the negative charges go this way, the flow of positivity, the flow of positive charges is the exact opposite way, which is also the conventional historic direction of current. So whenever I say current is flowing, I am referring to the opposite direction of the flow of the electrons because they are negatively charged. Okay, so let me just mention that over here. Current is nothing but the flow of electric current. So the current, the symbol is I, is nothing but the fl uh, rate of flow, the flow rate of nothing but charges and the direction the direction is opposite to that of to that of the motion of electrons to that of the motion of electrons keep this in mind uh, although it has a direction it is still a scalar quantity because it does not follow any laws of vector addition so it is still going to be a scalar and the unit is going to be ampere. So one ampere of current is when one coulomb of charge flows in one second that is called as one ampere. Most of your appliances around you will be in milliamperes. The AC, the heater, the geyser and all these things will be in like 5 amps, 10 amps uh, range. The formula for current is nothing but charge by time. But if you want instantaneous value of the current, then you write it as derivative of the charge with respect to the time. So this is the instantaneous value. This is like more like the average value if the currents are varying. Is that okay, guys? Everyone? So definitely, Jivananda. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, Anubhomik, I had chocolates. I had two dark chocolates. That's all. And that was very relaxing and very soothing for me. So let's see if you guys can solve this question based on current. How many charges do you think will flow through a conductor if the current is 1.6 amperes in 2 seconds? In a matter of 2 seconds, how much charge or sorry, how many number of charges do you think will flow through a cross section? This is a cross section. So how many number of charges do you think will flow? Well, I know what is the definition of current. Current is basically the charge divided by the total charge that flows upon the time taken, upon the time which is taken. Now, I can also write the charge as the following. I know the charges which are flowing are electrons. Each electron has a charge of 1.6 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs. Multiplied with the number of electrons, I'll get the total number of charges. So n into basically E and divided by T. Time taken is T is the charge of a electron into the number of electrons will give me the total charge. Therefore, 
n will be equal to i t by e. So i is 1.6, time is 2, electron charge is 1.6, 10 to the power minus 19. 1.6, 1.6 cancels, it will just become 2 into 10 to the power 19. That's a huge number. That many electrons just go in 2 seconds. That, that many go in just 2 seconds. Okay, so I think uh, many of you made some mistake. I don't know why you guys made the mistake. I think you guys forgot this 1.6 maybe. Yeah, you guys forgot that 1.6. So that's why you wrote it as 3.2. Be careful guys. That E value also has to be substituted. Jeevanandam, Allied Crash Course, Problem Solving, Strategy, Mock Test, whatever I do in the channel and I ask you to do at home, that is enough. Just watching lectures is not enough. Yeah. So yes, whatever you guys found was the value of the charge and not the number of charges. Read the question carefully. Number N was asked, not the charge in coulombs. Okay. Cool. Great. Moving on to the next question. But before that, we'll talk about something called as the current density. Density means how much is there per unit something. Density of current means how much current flows per unit area of the cross section. If in a small wire the same current flows, the density, the accumulation, the crowding of the current is higher. So that is the meaning of density. The electrical current density is the amount of electric current flowing through that conductor per unit area. Per unit area. Now you don't have to worry about this cos theta. Most of the times that will not even bother you. Okay, but for now, let me just ignore this. I'll tell you why that cos theta comes in a bit. For now, just remember, current density is the current divided by the area. Now, the funny part is that current density is actually a vector quantity. It is a vector quantity. And like you can see, dimensionally over here or unit wise, this is amperes, this is meter square. The unit of current density will be amperes per meter square. Now, when you rewrite this formula in a slightly different way, when you rewrite this formula in a slightly different way, it will look like this. I is equal to JA, but really you do not write the formula like this. Current is a scalar quantity. Current density is a vector quantity. Area also can be made into a vector quantity. I'll tell you how. Imagine that this is your cross section. Imagine, imagine guys, just the current density always flows in the direction of the current. If the current is flowing in this direction, the current density is also in the same direction. The area vector, although area vector is always perpendicular to the area which you are considering. So this is your area vector. Just like you have taken it in Gauss's law or in magnetic flux or any other chapter. If you have a surface, you draw a perpendicular that gives me the area vector. Now do you see the area vector and the current density both are making certain amount of angle over here. Both are making some angle over here. So therefore I need to use nothing but the dot product. So J vector dot A vector which is J A cos theta. So now you know what is basically that theta in that uh, you know formula. Lot of people do not know what the theta stands for. It is basically the angle between density vector and the area vector. Got it? Okay, always keep this in mind. This vector is always in the direction of the current. Wherever current is, it is always in the direction of the flow of the current. That's what is the direction of current density in case they ask you about it. Awesome, awesome. Clear or understood? Shall we move ahead? Okay, very important current density formula. How much current is there accumulated per unit area, meter square. The next thing is drift speed. Imagine I have a bulb, okay, like this. And maybe it is connected to a switch. And maybe it is connected to a battery like so. This way. And I just turn on that switch. At t is equal to zero, I turn it on. How much time do you think will it take for the bulb to glow? How much time do you think will the bulb take to glow after I turn on the switch? Instantly, right? So I can clearly say 
द मोमेंट द मोमेंट द मोमेंट स्विच इज क्लोज द मोमेंट स्विच इज क्लोज द बल्ब द बल्ब ग्लोज इंस्टेंटली द बल्ब ग्लोज इंस्टेंटली बिकॉज इलेक्ट्रिसिटी ट्रेवल्स एट द स्पीड ऑफ लाइट Yes, it travels at the speed of light. The electric field is set up inside of it instantly. Everything inside of it will start, uh, you know, moving. All the electrons will start moving inside the conductor. All the electrons are in motion, so there is a field set up. There is a current set up instantly by the speed of light. But these electrons, which are actually there technically, these electrons which are negatively charged. So let me just show it over here. the electrons are moving very slowly all electrons are moving together no doubt about it these electrons are moving some of them are even crossing the battery but they move slowly very slowly in fact but all of them move together all of them are moving slowly they will move so there is current in it their speeds are in few centimeters or micrometers per second that's how slow they are and that speed with which they move you can see this is a very nice animation of the uh, motion of the electrons you can see the electrons are moving the red ones are basically the nuclei the electrons keep moving slowly they make their way through the network or basically the maze of nuclei present they keep hitting each other they collide they lose they again gain energy they gain momentum so they keep moving slowly in that conductor so that is called as drift speed it is basically the average speed of the motion of electrons when a uh, current flows when the current flows inside a conductor the formula for that is very easy guys if you remember the graphics card company many of you know this already because i have told it but still the graphics card company called as nvidia it becomes very easy to remember the formula nvidia so current is n v d a n v d a that's it remember the formula that's it done done are done so here what are the different terms i is nothing but your current this i is nothing but your current this a is nothing but the area this e is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 this vd is basically your drift speed this is basically your drift velocity so what is this n you might ask this is generally given to you and that is called as your free charge density free charge density so this is generally your free charge density free charge density okay so it's basically number of free electrons per unit volume generally it is given 10 to the power 20 per meter cube 10 to the power 17 per centimeter cube whatever is the value is given to you it depends completely on the material what does this depend on it depends on the material that you are talking about whether it's aluminium or copper or gold if it's a good conductor it will have a good value of n if it's a bad conductor the value of n will also go down is that okay great now remember one thing the electrons are not actually moving at this speed this is the average speed that's why this word average is very important this word average is very important because the electron might go zoom karke it will go here collide again it will go here again it will go here 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 and slowly it is going zoom 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 slowly it will keep drifting the actual speed is different that comes because of the thermal collisions because of the electric field applied that is very high that is very high that is generally referred to as the speed of the electrons because of the thermal energy but that is not what is of interest to us it has got no use to us what is more important is what is the speed with which they cross a conductor or a section that creates the flow of the current that's what is more important okay yep moving on to another parameter and this is mobility oh by the way this is also there in semiconductors like aptly pointed out by kato we have a student named kato by my name very good yes yes greatest humanic ever perfect 
and that is mobility this is also there in semiconductor how mobile they are what do i mean by this understand imagine i have a conductor this is a conductor and this is another conductor i apply a voltage battery to it so what will the voltage difference do it will create electric field it will create electric field so there is e field created inside of it so both the conductors you will see there is an electric field created in this conductor i see that the charges move really fast i see that they are really fast whereas in this i see they are little bit slow i see that they are slow so what will i say this is more mobile there are more mobile the charges here they are less mobile they are less mobile correct so per electric field how much is the speed of the charges so electric field is there in the denominator because it is per electric field and what is the speed of the charges on an average which is the drift velocity that ratio is called as the mobility that ratio is called as the mobility understood everyone so mobility is nothing but the ratio of your drift speed drift speed per unit electric field that's all this is your electric field electric field is necessary without that you will not have voltages without that you will not have the charges moving remember that inside these wires you will always have electric fields which are constantly pushing these charges go 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 karke that motivation is required awesome strider i am nice uh, nice to see you bacha live i know it's a very different thing and uh, for all the students likewise if you are watching it live so it feels different when you are watching it recorded and also vice versa because you are wa generally watching uh, in recorded and at 2x or 3x speed and then here i am and live in front of you answering all your things awesome prem anu kamal positive yes perfect let's move on to the next question when current flows through a conductor then the order that means approximate range of the speed of the electrons drifting is how much 10 to the power 10 cm per second 10 to the power minus 2 cm per second 10 to the power 4 cm per second 10 to the power minus 6 cm per second what do you think is the approximate range of the flow of the electron speed wise drifting wise it's not very large it's not very small it's approximately in this range no it is not this like i said it ranges from few millimeters centimeters to max a few micrometers micrometer is 10 to the power minus 8 to 10 to the power minus 2 meters centimeters wise it is few uh, like millimeters here and there so that means 10 to the power minus 2 centimeters and that is a good range of the average speed of the electrons okay so that is the theory part which you should know you cannot derive it is just generally found next this was a ai pmt question a metallic conductor non uniform cross section a constant voltage is applied the quantity which remains constant throughout that conductor is let's see if you guys can figure this out so imagine a conductor of non uniform cross section something like this the quantity which remains same throughout is it the density or is it the current or is it the speed or is it the electric field what do you think is the correct answer to that okay come on well whatever current whatever current starts from here the same current should cross here whatever charges go here should also cross here there should be the same flow the rate rate of flow the rate of flow in should be equal to out else where are you getting the new charges from if there are more charges coming out and less charges entering in where are you getting the more charges from so whatever is going in is going out so the current is basically going to be the same but the density the speed the field that is going to be weak or strong or more or less depending on whether it is big or less okay so it's the current which is the same across all the cross sections perfect this was a previous year question next question up on your screen there is a charged particle having a drift speed and electric field then what do you think is the mobility si units everything is a si unit 
हाउ इज ड्रिफ्ट स्पीड अफेक्टेड बाई एरिया लुक एट दॉर्मुला बच्चा ओवर हियर वेर डेड इट गो ड्रिफ्ट स्पीड इज अफेक्टेड बाई एरिया VD will be I by N E A. So current is same, N is constant, E is constant. Area changes, drift speed changes. The moment drift speed changes, you will see mobility also changes, electric or electric field changes basically. Come on, let's see the next question. Yep, coming up on your screen. This is a NEET 2020 question. I hope Anu, you understood it. Yes, looks like you have. Okay. So what do we have to find out over here? We have to find out the mobility. Mobility. is the value of the drift speed per unit electric field is the drift speed given yes it is 7.5 10 to the power minus 4 is the electric field given yes it is 3 into 10 to the power what is it minus 10 now what can you do guys 75 divided by 3 is 25 so 7.5 divided by 3 will be 2.5 and over here this will go on the top it will become 10 to the power 10 minus 4 so this will become 2.5 Into 10 to the power 6. 2.5 into 10 to the power 6. Where is it? Option A, of course, not B. It is not minus 6. It is plus 6. Yes, Naveen, Aishwarya, Prem, Piyush, very good. Sampad, Libita, Ashrita, Jolin, Tarika, awesome, awesome, Naveen, awesome. Yes, it is not B. Yeah, Nishant, very good. Sampad, very good. Yes, option A is the correct answer. This was asked in NEET 2020. So many of you guys asked, sir, are the questions from current electricity very difficult? No, right? See, these are all PYQs, and I'm not chosen very simple PYQs or anything. I've just taken random PYQs from any uh, year in the recent years, and you will see that they do not ask very complicated questions. They just ask to the point. Okay, just ask to the point. Okay. Now, let's go ahead a little bit. Now. that we have spoken about what is current what is the density of current what is the average speed which is the drift speed the next part that we will focus on is the resistance so resistance is nothing but going to block the current or it uh, allows less current to flow when you pass uh, the current through it so resistance blocks or it uh, basically reduces the flow of the current and the manner in which i show resistance is using a symbol like this symbol is a uh, mathematically r and it completely depends on the area of the wire through which the current is passing the length of the wire through which it is passing and a property called as resistivity of that material so this is basically a material property it is basically a material property this is a material property and it is different for different materials for good conductors for good conductors you will see that the value of rho is less for insulators insulators or bad conductors you will see the resistivity is very very high so that is how resistivity changes very good conductor very less resistivity now the formula for resistance is this one it is resistivity into length divided by area so rho l by a is the resistance of any conductor rho l by a now often what happens they give you problems where a wire is stretched or it is compressed in such cases i'll just put it over here when a wire when a wire is basically stretched when a wire is basically stretched or compressed then what happens is the volume doesn't change it is a constant so the volume which is area into length remains constant so if the length increases the area reduces if the length decreases if the length decreases then the area increases so when you elongate it it becomes narrower so that's something which you need to keep in mind hence the formula for resistance becomes rho l instead of area instead of area you just put it as v by l so the value of resistance becomes rho l square by v this is a formula when you stretch it or compress it okay so it is proportional to the square of the length when you are taking the same wire and elongating or compressing it is that okay exactly very important awesome awesome harshini don't worry more 45 minutes or something like that and if you want to munch something you can always do that don't worry okay moving on to the next point and that is does temperature change the resistance the answer for that is yes 
when you have a hot wire as compared to a cold wire hotness means more thermal energy more noise in the classroom all the students are jumping around here and there they are hitting each other colliding with each other it's very difficult to make your way through that maze so because it becomes more energetic it's more difficult for the electrons to you know find a path and go through that means the resistance increases so that's why you will see the resistance depends on the uh, temperature so as temperature increases the resistance also increases for a conductor very very crucial important thing and the value of the resistance at any temperature t is given by value of resistance at a reference or 0 degree celsius example into 1 plus alpha delta t this formula looks very similar to linear expansion in thermodynamics l is l naught 1 plus alpha delta t so this is a very very important formula remember this and the value of alpha is basically called as the coefficient of thermal resistance it is generally given to you so coefficient of thermal resistance that's the formula uh, that's the meaning of alpha so if alpha is given and how much is the change is given you can find the new resistance now please keep one more thing in mind this is valid for small range only valid for small changes in temperature if it is very large then the formula becomes non-linear so this is valid for only small changes in the temperature like 20 degrees 50 degrees 60 degrees it's okay but the moment you change it by 200 degrees 500 degrees and stuff like that then the variations are significant and then it is no longer a line linear curve or a graph or an equation it is uh, having going to be curved manner it's going to have many more higher order terms okay so keep this in mind all right so this is basically temperature dependence uh, of uh, sorry uh, yeah temperature dependence of resistance as temperature increases energy increases the resistance also increases formula is very similar to linear expansion in thermo let's see if we can solve this neat 2020 question which of the following graph represents the variation of resistance or resistivity with temperature for copper so basically conductor come on think about it what do you think is the correct graph shown for resistivity with temperature Okay, Piyush saying B, Anu saying A, Prem saying D. Interesting, we have variations in the answers. Libita saying B, Nishan saying B, Sampath saying B. Interesting. Priya Kumari also saying B, Acharita saying B. Okay, many of you are going with B now. Is that so? Yep. So, it can't be this because as temperature is increasing, resistivity is decreasing. So, definitely not this. This also can't be correct because when temperature increases, how can resistivity decrease? So either it is this or this. Now this is a line whereas this is a curve. Now what did I tell you? For small changes it is like a line but for large changes then it becomes a curve. So maybe for small changes it looks like a line but as the temperature changes increase you will see it becomes a curved manner. So hence this should be the correct answer which is option B. Okay clear for small ranges it is like a line it feels like a line but for large changes it becomes a curved line. Perfect that's the correct answer okay now we come to ohm's law which is very simple it says that you won't have done this in school guys when you apply your battery's voltage and you measure the current the more voltage you apply the more current that comes out of it this behavior was studied by ohm and he said that as you increase the voltage the current also increases proportionately and then he gave the relationship voltage is current into resistance but not all devices follow the same principle there are only certain devices which you which are generally around you follow this principle they are called as ohmic devices like this one so this is basically a ohmic device ohmic device example example your resistance but there are non ohmic devices where voltage is not proportional to i example semiconductors example semiconductors you would have studied the topic or maybe you will be studying it soon so semiconductor so those devices voltage is non-linearly proportional to the current the behavior can drastically change 
with the apply of voltage. So those are non-ohmic devices. In this chapter, we are going to only study ohmic devices which basically follow Ohm's law. So as per that, as per that, you will see if you have a resistance like this one, okay, and let's say somebody measures the voltage difference across it to be delta V, let's say the current is I, then delta V, the voltage difference is always I into R. Keep this in mind. So R is the resistance. And remember one thing, when I say delta V is IR, which one is at higher potential, which one is at lower potential, please bear this in mind. Please bear this in mind. When I put, when I put uh, delta V, the voltage difference is IR is equal to current into resistance. Always current flows from high voltage to low voltage inside a resistor. So basically this is higher potential, higher potential. This is going to be basically lower potential. Very, very important. Just to give you an example out of this. Imagine there is a resistance like this, maybe of 5 ohms. And let's say the current flowing is let's say 2 amperes. Assume that this point has a voltage of, I don't know, maybe 25 volts. Example. Now I ask you, what is the voltage at this particular point? What is the voltage at this particular point? What will you do? Observe carefully. Observe carefully. Voltage difference, I know, is IR. Current is 2 amperes, resistance is 5. So it is basically 10 volts, correct? The voltage difference is 10. That means this point minus this point's voltage is 10. Now, is this going to be higher by 10 or lower by 10? Look at the direction of the current. The current is going like this. So it will always go from high to low. Current is going like this. It will go from high to low. Correct guys? So that means it will go from 25 volts to less volts. So hence over here, the answer will be 25 minus 10, which is basically 15 volts. Exactly. Yep. Understood? Clear? Uh, Anish, if you watch all my Nurture Pathfinder and you're doing fingertips, PYQs, you should be able to get 150 plus easily. Okay? Yes, this is full lecture, but you have to watch it from the beginning. Awesome. Awesome. So let's solve a question. The resistivity of a potentiometer wire is this much. The area of cross section is this much. Okay? Uh, if the current flowing in it is 0.2 amperes of current, then what is the gradient of the potential? Now, the moment you hear this word potential gradient, what it means you should understand. It is the voltage drop. It is the voltage drop or voltage changes per unit length or basically distance. That is the meaning of voltage uh, gradient or potential gradient. So question says, what is the voltage gradient? So voltage difference per unit length, that is what it is. Voltage is nothing but current into resistance rate divided by the length of it. But wait a minute, resistivity is given and resistance can be written down in terms of resistivity like this. Resistivity times of length by A. R is rho L by A. This L is also there. LL cancels. So I rho by A. That's it. So now it's just a matter of substituting all the values. Is the current given? Yes. It is 0.2. Is the resistivity given? Yes. It is 40 into 10 to the power minus 8. Divided by. Is the area given? Check it out. 8 into 10 to the power minus 6. What should be the answer? What should be the answer? Come on, my dear students. Isn't it going to be option A? Very good. 10 to the power minus 2 because 4 to the 8, 10 to the power minus 8, 10 to the power minus 6, only 10 to the power minus 2 will remain. Everything else will cancel out over here. Very nice. So this is how you can solve the question. And this is the meaning of potential gradient. Okay. Now let's go to the different combinations of resistors. This is generally done in 10 standard, but just revising quickly through it. Whenever resistors are in series, okay, the two combinations. So first one is series. When resistors are in series, what is same guys? It is the current which is basically the same. The current is same, but the voltage drops V1, V2, V3, they are not going to be the same. In fact, V1 will be current into resistance one. V2 will be current into resistance across the second one and so on and so forth. 
In fact, the total voltage will be V1 plus V2 plus V3, so on and so forth, right? This is how it works. And the total resistance equivalent is just R1 plus R2 plus R3. It's not 1 by R1 plus 1 by R2, like in capacitors. It's opposite, okay? So that is for resistors in series. Whereas in parallel, what happens is the current which comes in, it gets distributed into multiple branches, just like capacitors, the charges get split up into different branches. So the total current will be I1 plus I2 plus so on and so forth. It's a voltage drop, which is basically same for all. The voltage drop is same for all. And the equivalent resistance is given by 1 by R1 plus 1 by R2 plus 1 by R3 and so on and so forth. Okay, that's for resistors in series and parallel. Now there are multiple ways to find resistors equivalent. Sometimes it is not easily seen that oh my god it is in series or in parallel. You have to rearrange the terms, you have to visualize it again or you have to use some symmetry or some kind of technique to find out the equivalent. Generally the problems which come in need are very simple standard type. Usually the most complex of the complex questions also are completely based on disguised forms or Wheatstone's bridge or very basic elementary symmetry. So let's do some questions maybe. Look at this question. Okay, 5 ohms, 5 ohms, 6 ohms, from between you take a point S and there is another point P from here. Question is what's the equivalent resistance of this? What type of connection is there at home? Obviously it is parallel, very good. And I hope you answered it correctly on ohmic. Is there a table in NCRT regarding carbon resistor color codes? Do we have to go through it? Is there a question? If uh, it's still there in the NCRT, yes, you will have to. If it is not there, then skip it. Just check the current syllabus portion. If it is there, then go through it. Otherwise, it's simple. B.B. Roy of Great Britain had a very good wife. Okay, so just remember that you will get it. It's not so difficult. Okay, now, how to solve this question? Reimagine this. How do I reimagine this? Observe, I take this S point below, take that P point on the top. That P point, I'll take it on the top. And in between, I'm taking a point. So I'll just split the two resistors just for our simplicity sake. And I'll take this point from here. This is point S. Okay, this is 5 ohms. This is also 5 ohms. And this 6, I'll split it into two resistors, 3 ohms each. Okay, now it looks like it is doable. This 3 and this 5 are one after the other. This 3, this 5, one after the other. They are placed side by side. So now I know what this is actually speaking. There is one 5 ohms, there is one 3 ohms, that's it. And there is one 3 ohms and there is one 5 ohms. And that's about it. So this is P, this is S, this is 5, this is 3, this is 5, this is 3. Now we all know these two are in basically nothing but series. So are these two in series. So 5 plus 3 is nothing but 8 ohms. So now 8 ohms is parallel to another 8 ohms. So what will be the total combination of it? The total combination, 8 ohms and 8 ohms are in parallel. If you want to do it, do it. 1 by 8 plus 1 by 8 is 1 by RP. So 1 by, uh, sorry, this will be 2 by 8 is 1 by RP. So 2 goes with 8 4 times. So RP will be basically 4 ohms. RP will be basically 4 ohms. Perfect. Option D is the correct answer. Very good. Very good. So many of you answered it. Very good. Jolin Prem. Ashita Tarika Sampath. Nishant, Anu, Ashita, very nice guys, proud of all of you and those of you are sitting silently, don't worry guys, you are all in this together even if you make 100 mistakes, nobody is going to judge you because you have come here to learn. So mark your presence, I will also know, others will also know and you will slowly learn from your mistakes, else you will always be scared, okay? So come on, keep answering. Next question, wow, beautiful question, this is I think disguised form. It is looking complex, but actually it is disguised. So if you uncover the disguise, if you see what truly it is, you will see, oh my God, it is such a simple circuit. So what is the equivalent resistance between point A and B? Okay, let's redraw it. Maybe take a point here. I will call this point C. Take a point here. Maybe I'll call it D. Take a point here. Maybe I'll call it E. Okay, just observe now what I'm going to do. Start from this point. There is only one ohm resistance. So from this point, I just draw one ohm resistance and I encounter this point C. 
Now, what is this C connected to? Observe one by one. And whichever resistance is drawn, I'm just crossing it out. This C is connected to this resistance, which is connected to D. Okay, fair enough. And uh, this D is connected to another resistance, which is connected to E. And this E is also connected to C. Oh my God, crazy. Okay, now I got some idea. I'll take care of this resistance. So I'll just put a cross over there. So this resistance is already done. Okay, which is just basically connected to this particular point D. Perfect. C is also connected to E. C is also connected to E. Interesting. Okay, so let me just take a point over here, which is basically E. E is connected to this resistor. E is connected to this resistor and also that resistor. So E is connected to one more resistor over here. So I'll just cross it out. This is done. And it is also connected to one more resistor over here. So I will just cross that out as well. Both these resistors are connected to this point D only. You can notice if this is D, this is also as good as D only. F and D are connected to each other. So maybe one of the resistor is connected to D again. And this, although it is connected to F, this resistor, if it is already connected to F, F is indirectly connected to D only. Do you see that guys? Do you see that guys? Everyone with me? Yep. Perfect. Lastly, this F, this F is connected to D. D and F are the same thing. That is finally connected to this one ohm resistor, finally connected to B. That's what it is. This is one ohm. This is one ohm. This is one ohm. Now, do you see what these three things are in? Do you see what these three things actually are in? Actually, they are nothing but in parallel. So the parallel resistance will be 1 by 3. That's all. 1 by 3 ohm. Whenever you see this kind of circuit, 99% guys, it will be a parallel circuit. Put this in your head. The moment you see one wire going from top and below, that's it. It will be a parallel circuit. This is a simple way of solving this now. So the final equivalent circuit uh, will be this resistance plus this plus this because they are all in series. So it will be 1 plus 1 by 3 plus 1. That's it. So 1 plus 1 is 2. So 2 plus 1 by 3. So 3 to the 6 plus 1 is 7. So 7 by 3 ohms. 7 by 3 ohms. Where is it? Option C. C for captain's rears. Perfect. Got it, my dear students? Yes, neat motivation. It is one, one shot. Yep, yep. So just to quickly repeat and recollect what we have done. I just marked certain points. I just marked certain points. That's all. And I started from one end and slowly reached the other end. Go with the flow. There is nothing to buy heart. I started from here. Oh, I got this resistance. Okay. I read C. Okay. This resistance is there. I draw, draw it here. Oh, C is connected to E. Oh, C is connected to E. Oh, E is connected to this and this. E is connected to this and this. This resistor is connected to D. This resistor is connected to F. But D and F are connected to each other. Okay. And finally, that is connected to this resistor. Oh. So, you will get it by solving more and more questions. That's it. Moving on to another question. But before that, that is Wheatstone's bridge. What is Wheatstone's bridge? Basically, four resistors arranged in this particular manner. Four resistors arranged in this particular manner is called as a Wheatstone's bridge. Where you have one branch here and the another branch here. And the two branches in between are connected by a... A measuring device like a galvanometer. Galvanometer nothing but gets deflected when current flows. More current, more deflection. No current, no deflection. Reverse the current, reverse deflection. So current changes the deflection of the galvanometer. It basically is a current measuring device. This whole circuit you connected to an external supply or a battery. And now the current will come from here and it will flow like this. You might see these two points might be at different potential. If if, observe this, if potential of point B not equals to potential of point D, then the current flowing through the galvanometer will not be zero. So there will be some kind of deflection which will occur. Such a case is said to be unbalanced condition. It is said to be unbalanced condition. It is not a balanced bridge. But if it so happens, VB point B and point D 
the potentials are equal because the potentials are equal there is no need of current so the current flowing through the galvanometer will be zero so such a condition is basically null deflection it's a null deflection no deflection in the galvanometer such a situation is said to be balanced condition balanced condition whenever you see balanced condition you will see this by this and this by this are in the same ratio this by this so p by q will be equal to r by s so this is completely useless so g is going to be completely useless it's basically completely useless device so whenever it is a balanced wheatstone that is the ratios are equal for the resistance then whatever is connected in between can be completely forgotten can be completely forgotten so that's why you will see the circuit will just boil down to this resistance this resistance this resistance and this resistance that's it where you will notice these two are in series and these two are also in series and their combination is now in parallel this one is in parallel with this one so you can solve it in a very easy manner these two series these two series and their combination in parallel that's what it is so what to do if it is unbalanced well you have to use something called as kirchhoff's current law and voltage law which will be seeing soon but those kind of questions do not come in neat number one number two balanced is what you will generally get in the need examination and even in the boards so they are not going to give you unbalanced even if a question comes just leave it it's not worth your time effort and money okay it's not going to come i'm telling you anyways so the one which you should focus on is balancing condition and you should also know which a uh, device you can remove if there was a capacitor you can forget it if there is a battery you can forget it if there is a resistor you can forget it if there is a wire you can forget it so that's the beauty of balanced wheatstone circuit okay everyone cool now you have a instrument which is used to measure resistance based on this principle that is called as basically your meter bridge it looks something like this but the simpler version is this one what exactly is the concept understand imagine i want to find the resistance of some object some device okay some device i want to find the resistance what is the way you will be like sir i apply voltage i apply i see the current i divide voltage and current i'll get the resistance well that's one way there is another device which can give you the value of the resistance in a very easy manner imagine i know this resistance but i do not know this resistance i also know this resistance i know p i know q i know p and i also know q i do not know r but i can change the value of s i am allowed to change by using a knob or using different resistors i am allowed to change s i put one resistor i note the reading in the galvanometer i see that oh it gets deflected if it's getting deflected it is not balanced i keep changing the resistance till it shows no deflection that means the bridge is balanced that means this ratio is obtained that means p by q is r by s so i know the value of p perfect i know the value of q perfect i have adjusted s so i know the value of s so p is known q is known s is known what is not known r easily you can find it understood clear so this is how you can find unknown resistance using a wheatstone setup now in order to do that this is what the device is used okay here you have a wire which is highly resistive here you have the known resistance here you have the unknown resistance or this is known this is unknown one or the other you take a point in between the two resistors connect it via a galvanometer to a point on this wire which is also called as the potentiometer wire and it is generally of 100 cm or a meter that's why it is called as a meter uh, bridge that word meter bridge has come because usually the wire's length is 1 meter or 100 cm but you can have other lengths notice one interesting thing notice one very interesting thing over here this part of the wire has certain resistance this part of the wire also has some resistance if i call this resistance as p or r1 
and this for instance as R2 then I don't know whether you can see this now there is this battery the current is getting distributed in two branches one here and one here in between you are connecting it using a galvanometer and again they are meeting over here if I keep shifting this point till I see no deflection so what will happen think about it at null deflection at null deflection what will I get I will get basically a balanced bridge I'll basically get a balanced bridge yes or no guys I'll get a balanced bridge perfect so that means this by this is this by this so therefore R1 by R2 is basically R by S but I know one more thing resistance is directly proportional to the length of the wire this is proportional to this length of the wire if this is L1 can I not say it is K times of L1 and R2 will be K times of 100 minus L1 because if this is L1 this is 100 this is 100 minus L1 so K is some constant because I know resistance is always proportional to the length so R by S K K cancels I will get this formula clear okay I hope this is understood awesome 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 great let's move on okay I am daily feel like about to like not worth for your hard work what happened on the study don't get depressed but uh, Roman I don't know my, my around a two and a half hours lecture okay so are you, others your GF is waiting for you please go man this is not at all important what will happen if you learn current electricity what you have to become an electrician yeah no na so girlfriend is more important man please go run fast she's waiting if she goes away then what will happen you know how will you start your family how are you going to grow in life so run quickly current electricity capacitors is not going to help you at all in life okay moving on to the next question coming up on your screen we have a bridge it is balanced by the condition p by q is l1 by l2 this by this perfect meter bridge there is a galvanometer in between this is a potentiometer wire length one is here length two is here this point is usually called as a jockey okay not the underwear guys this is basically a movable point okay on that wire which makes a connection with that wire with the galvanometer that's all so this is a movable point always called as a jockey and PQ are known resistance or unknown resistance one of them and L1 L2 are the lengths which are measured so if you now interchange the battery and the galvanometer if you take this guy here and battery here what do you think will be the new null point location yeah cells and EMF questions are also important I'll be coming to cells and EMFs in a bit hold on bacha for some time hold on hold on Come on. So this is for NEET or board exam. This is for NEET Rajan, but it will be helpful for you in the board examination. D. Okay, let's try to figure this out. Let's interchange first. So let's put galvanometer here. This is point P, sorry, resistance P. This is the resistance Q. Okay. And using the galvan. Oh, sorry. Now I have to put the cell here. I'm just interchanging the positions. Okay. So that's it. Okay. There you go. This is your jockey point. This is L1. This is L2. Okay. Now, look over here carefully in the first diagram. If there was current I over here, the same I will come here. It is getting split into I1 and I2. Now, the same I1 goes through Q and also goes through L2. I2 goes through L2. I1 goes through Q and they both merge together to again give you I is that right this is what is happening right over here now I have interchanged the positions let's see what is happening in this situation let's see if it is same or different this is a battery the battery supplies some current some current goes here some current goes here the battery is supplying let's say current I whatever flows through P assuming the galvanometer is not getting deflected so this is null deflection null deflection means no current at all so whatever current goes here will go through this point and whatever goes through Q will go through L2 also Q and L2 
okay q and l2 just check it out and p and basically what is this l1 p and l1 okay interesting p and l1 no not the same q and l2 definitely not the same so what do you think will happen what do you think will happen guys is it the same flow of the current which is happening right now is it the same flow of the current which is happening right now yes or no no right the current distribution has changed the current distribution has changed okay now you'll be like okay now that means will the will the null point also change let's try this out let's figure that out over here if you had to write down the null deflection formula null deflection formula what will you write p by l1 p by l1 is q is q by l2 p by l1 is q by l2 isn't that right everyone with me okay whatever current goes through p is also going through l1 so p by l1 whatever current is going through q is q by l2 over here what is the formula that you will write think about it whatever is going through p is also going through q so p by q whatever is going through l1 is also going through l2 so l1 by l2 is this formula and this formula the same like no sir this is different think again it is actually the same thing think q you bring it down take l1 on the top isn't it the same thing the current distributions have changed but the balancing point the balancing lengths are still the same hence the answer is yes p by q is still going to be l1 by l2 yep what a brilliant question isn't it so you just had to visualize it you just had to visualize it in a different way and just had to see oh this by this is this by this that's it it's the same thing rearranged moving on now to the next part and that is basically a cell beautiful question so what is a cell and somebody asked what is the difference between cell and a capacitor do you remember yes or no put it up in the chat box uh, atoms theory sophie george i have already done it please watch the modern physics uh, playlist it's there on the home page of the channel itself entire modern physics atomic structure photoelectric effect wave particle duality nucleus semiconductor it done watch that okay it's part of the crash course so a battery has the ability to convert chemical energy into electrical energy while discharging while charging electrical gets converted into chemical so look at this battery so there are two conditions in which you can operate a battery so first condition is when you are basically discharging it when you are discharging it in case of discharging the electrical energy sorry i would say chemical energy the chemical energy gets converted into electrical energy this is the first situation the second situation is when you are basically charging the battery when you are charging the battery in such a case the electrical energy gets stored in the form of chemical energy if you want to look at the diagram of how it looks like while for discharging and charging it looks something like this so there is a battery it might have some amount of internal resistance which is the resistance which is there inside the battery and it basically supplies the current this is the emf this is the internal resistance so you can see the current is being basically supplied by the cell by the cell it the current is supplied by the cell it is coming from the positive terminal if you look at the uh, charging battery situation the direction of current will be exactly opposite guys okay it will be like this it will be coming into the battery it will be coming into the battery so it is supplied to the battery it is supplied to the battery very very important is that clear very very crucial now if you measure the voltage across the cell it will not be e in either of the cases yes e is the emf if there was no a uh, voltage uh, sorry there was no internal resistance then you would get the emf is equal to the voltage difference but because there is some drop across the resistor what you will notice is this funny thing across these two points the voltage difference will be 
E minus IR. It is slightly less than E because of this drop. So what you get is after the tax cut, commission. So this is commission because it's taking uh, some amount of uh, voltage internally within the battery. Same way happens in the exact reverse situation. When you charge the battery, the voltage difference is actually higher than the EMF. You might be like, I thought it is going to be lower in this case. The reason for that is because when you supply, you have to supply more because there is going to be a tax cut. It's like you know, if you give, your parents know that if you uh, ask, uh, uh, if, if your parents ask you to give uh, sweets to your brother or sister, you are going to eat some part of it. So they will give you more because they know you are going to slowly take one chocolate and put it in your mouth and give the remaining to your friend or brother or sister, right? Same way while you are charging it, it knows that there will be some drop across the resistance. So you have to supply more. So this delta V will be E plus IR. E plus IR. Okay. Now why does this internal resistance arise, you might ask? So let me put it over here. R is basically your internal resistance internal resistance so this comes because when the charges move inside the battery there is some fluid or some solid or whatever there is some gel inside that battery that gel or that liquid that electrolytes offer some resistance that resistance cannot be removed no matter what you do that's why there is an internal resistance is that okay guys perfect so that is your internal resistance. Keep this in mind. So that is a part of the cell. The cell will be probably like this. It's there inside the cell. You cannot get rid of it. This is the positive terminal. This is the negative terminal. Cool. Perfecto. Perfecto. It's corrupted. Very good. Stradha Shodkar, very nice to see Bacha, your first lecture and I'm so happy and glad that you guys are enjoying it. Keep enjoying, keep learning and please score a lot of marks and I know you're going to do that because of all the hard work that not just I am putting in but also you guys are putting in after the lecture is over and please do that. So I have talked about what is the voltage difference across a cell, when is it less, when is it more. So while discharging and while charging, both the important scenario, scenarios are being done. What is the meaning of internal resistance? Also done. Now, there are a lot of funny questions where you have batteries also combined one after the other. Imagine, imagine a situation where there is a battery like this and another battery like this. Let's say this is 6 volt, 2 ohms internal. This is 4 volt. And this is 4 volt, this is 4 volt and let's say this is 1 ohm internal resistance. You can convert this into one single battery of 6 plus 4 which is 10 volts and one single resistance which is 2 plus 1 which is basically 3 ohms. These are batteries in series. Another simple example, imagine you have the same 6 volt battery, 2 ohm resistance but now it is opposite to the 4 volt battery with one ohm resistance. Then when you convert it into a single battery and single resistance, what will be the EMF and resistance? Come on, put it up in the chat box. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Think. No internal resistance, more current, then why place it? Prem, nobody is placing it, it happens. It's there. It's not like you have a choice. It will always be there because any battery, when the current goes inside the battery, it will encounter some resistance. It's like saying, Sir, can I get all in the rank 1 in NEET without hard work? No, it is not a matter of choice. It will be there. The hard work will be there. You cannot say that, No, sir, I don't want to do hard work. So, understand that. Okay. So, yes, 6 and 4 are opposite. So, it will be 6 minus 4, which is basically 2 volts. Ohms will get added. Resistance don't get subtracted. There is always 2 plus 1 which is basically 3 ohms. Is that okay? Very nice. 2 volts and 3 ohms. Perfect. Perfect. It is not minus 10. Be careful. 6 is this way. 4 is that way. So totally 2 volts that way. 6 minus 4. Okay. Now the final formula which I will write it is E1 
I can put plus minus plus minus because I do not know whether they help or they oppose that's why that plus minus so like this you will have many terms okay till n uh, number of cells and equivalent resistance in series is just simple addition there is no plus minus in that r1 plus r2 plus r3 like that so on and so forth cool guys everyone with me so that is for uh, uh, cells in series very very important formula you should know what happens when they help and oppose each other what happens when they are in parallel then the formula is slightly different imagine a cell here and cell here and another cell here they are in parallel then their currents add up to give a large current so they behave slightly differently the equivalent emf for parallel is given by e1 by r1 plus minus e2 by r2 so on and so forth the whole thing divided by 1 by r1 plus 1 by r2 plus so on and so forth there is no plus minus here there is only plus minus here because what if you reverse the polarities if you reverse the polarity then you have to take the minus sign if all are in the same direction then you just put plus 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 so this is a formula for emf in parallel and resistance is parallel is simple it's the same thing 1 by r1 plus 1 by r2 so on and so forth this is the formula when your batteries are in parallel we will be doing a question on that don't worry thank you yalapa bacha okay chalo let's go solve some problems get ready a current passes through a battery 1.5 volts emf internal resistance 0.15 ohm the voltage difference measured when uh, you connect uh, when you measure it using a voltmeter by measuring it across the ends of the cell will be how much first of all realize that this is a discharging circuit so you have the battery the internal resistance you are trying to measure the voltage difference across it the current is being supplied by the battery current is giving so it's discharging so this delta will be e minus ir it will be just e minus ir that's all so e is a uh, 1.5 current is a uh, how much how much how much 0.2 and uh, resistance is uh, 0.15 now 0.15 into 2 is 0 0.3 into 0 0.2 will be 0 0.03 so 1.5 minus 0 0.03 that's 150 minus 3 is 147 so 1.47 that's is volts so that should be answered you can see it's slightly less so whenever you have tried measuring the voltage of a battery you will see it is slightly less than the number printed on the battery that's because of this only internal resistance internal resistance awesome what is the physical meaning of short circuiting a battery well many of you might have even tried this but uh, not advisable i'll tell you why in a bit imagine you take a battery okay and you take this point and connect it to this point so basically there is nothing connected from outside it's just the same battery it's just the same battery the terminals are joined this is called as shorting the battery or shorting the terminals short means connect a wire short means connect the wire so this is basically uh, shorting the terminals oops shorting the terminals of the battery so in such a case what happens the current will be emf by resistance emf is e resistance is r now usually what happens my dear students internal resistance is very small and emf is decent enough so that means the current will be very very large so that current causes a lot of heating so that heating might even blast that battery which is very dangerous you might just burn your hands or face that is the reason why you should not generally short a battery it will get hot okay so you might have heard about electric scooters and cars catching fire so you definitely do not want any shorting to happen let's do another question Terminal potential difference of a cell is greater than its EMF when it is being discharged, open circuit, being charged, being either charged or discharged. What do you think is the correct answer? Done many times, Prem. Okay. Adarsh is an alien, I think. Uh, just like that Jadu had a, a sun to give power, I think Adarsh needs some current. Adarsh the electric man. Very good. 
I I thought you will ask your girlfriend no to give some current. Why are you asking me? What I'll I'll not give power man. I'll give you knowledge and I'll give you marks. Why are Chuma you are wasting your time with me? I'll just give you marks. I'll not give you oh, all what your girlfriend will give. Please ask your girlfriend man for current and all. GF not there. So sad are there. Sad life. GF also not there. Okay. So terminal potential difference of a cell is greater than the EMF when uh, it is being charged. I just told you when you charge it, you have to supply slightly more because you know something is already going to uh, go off. So that's why it is charged. E plus IR it is. Okay. Beautiful question on parallel circuits. Beautiful uh, question on parallel circuits of EMFs. So this battery parallel to this battery. The question says the current in the resistance R. That means there is no current outside if. Which of the conditions should be true? Beautiful question. Now, the way I look at it is like this. If there is no current over here, meaning when I combine these two, which are in parallel into one single battery, which will look something like this. This is RP, this is EP. And now it is connected basically to that resistor and I tell you that there is no current in it there is only one possibility that no current will flow in R only if EP is zero think about it if there is no net EMF if there is no net EMF there will be no current which will flow that means whatever current is there is just flowing within inside over here so whatever current is there is just going to flow like this inside nothing is coming out of this okay when can that happen I know the formula of EP it is nothing but E1 by R1. EP is nothing but E1 by R1. Oh, but not plus. I'll put minus because this E1 is left side. This E2 is right side. Left and right. Left and right. So that's why I'll put minus minus E2 by R2. And here I have 1 by R1 plus 1 by R2. Now this is 0. This is basically 0. Therefore, numerator is 0. That means E1 by R1 minus e2 by r2 is 0 denominator don't worry so solving this further e1 by r1 will be e2 by r2 that should be the condition that should be the condition where is that option b so such a simple question don't have to use any complicated laws is just a matter of understanding why the emf net will be zero because there is no current supplied outside so the battery behaves like nothing that's it zero volts Okay, going to the next part and that is basically electrical power. So we all know that when current flows through a resistance, it gets heated up through a wire. It also gets heated up. The energy lost per unit time is basically the power lost in a device or a resistor. The power lost in a device or a resistor and that is I squared R or V squared by R. Which formula will you use when? Which formula will you use when? It's simple. If you know the current, you'll use I squared R. If you know the voltage, you'll use V squared by R. That's it. As simple as that. Okay, keep this in mind. Now, I'll give you an interesting formula, which will help you a lot, especially when you want to avoid certain calculations. Imagine there is a bulb or a resistor and they both are basically connected in series. If this has power P1 individually, this has power P2 and you connect it to the same battery, then when connected in series, what happens is that when connected in series, what happens, my dear students, each of them had individual powers P1 and P2, then you will see 1 by PS, 1 by PS, sorry, 1 by PS will be 1 by P1 plus 1 by P2. So this is how you add powers when in series. It's exactly opposite of resistors, just like capacitors, you can say. And exact reverse for bulbs or resistors in parallel. Imagine a bulb of power P1 and another bulb or resistor of power P2. Okay, they both are in parallel across the same battery. Then the net power in parallel is just P1 plus P2. That's all. P1 plus P2. Yep. That's all. Okay. So keep this shortcut trick in mind. 
that will save you a lot of time in the examination. You don't have to break your head to find the resistance, current, voltage separately. It saves a lot of time. Let's see if you can solve this. In a circuit, the voltage across the load of 25 ohms is 200 volts. What is the power in the circuit which is being consumed or lost? Yes, just like capacitors. Yes, Sakshi. Yes, Nishant. Yes, reciprocal. Correcto. What lesson I have planned next? Sachin, I'll be doing English for the CVSE term. And then after that, I'll be doing electrostatics. Uh, uh, okay, just before your chemistry exam. And maybe if time permits magnetism, I don't know. And then uh, just before the board exams, we are going to have problem solving sessions for your board perspective. And then after that, uh, after the board exams are over, then I'm planning to conduct 11 standard portion crash course uh, sessions for the important topics. That's the plan. And then as the exam nears by one and a half month or so, then we'll be having many, many mock tests and uh, strategies and problem solving and tricks and tips sessions. That's the plan. Okay. So moving on. Optics is already done. But I just did optics. Yep. All right. So uh, power is V squared by R. I think that's the formula which I'm going to use. Voltage is basically 200. Resistance is basically 25. So this is going to be 400 and then like this and 25. What is the final answer? Option A. Very good. It's going to be 16 times, 25 goes with 416 times and these two zeros. So which is 1.6 kilowatts. Perfecto. That's the correct answer. Moving on to the next theory. That is Kirchhoff's current law and voltage law. Now, many times I've seen people do really well in Kirchhoff's current law, but in voltage law, they get confused with the science. But today I'm going to give you a beautiful chart and you will never ever ask me again. You'll never get confused again. Okay, so watch it in detail. So these two laws help us solve problems which otherwise are difficult to solve. Sometimes everything is not series and parallel. Sometimes you have to solve multiple circuits, complicated circuits. And what you do in complex circuits is you assume the currents. You assume some direction. And then you make equations. As many equations as there are unknowns. If there are five unknowns, five equations. Solve them simultaneously, find I1, I2, I3, I4. But don't worry, you're not going to get five equations, five unknowns. Rarest of the rarest, you will get two unknowns, I'm telling you. Not even three. Okay, if it comes out to three, it's going to be a very lengthy problem for all of you, trust me. You do not want to do that. It's a waste of time. Instead, go to some other problem. If time permits, then come back to the end. Sir, when do we use P, P is equal to VI? I'll come to that. Yes, um, I'll just tell you. It's the same thing even if you use P is equal to VI, right? It's the same thing. Oops, P is equal to VI. It's the same thing. It doesn't really matter. It's a different way of writing it. That's all. So if voltage and current flowing is known, you use V into I. Okay, cool. Awesome, awesome. Now, also one more thing. You, you generally use V into I for batteries. For example, if you have a cell which is having EMF E, and if it is giving current I, then the power which is supplied, the power which is supplied is E into I, voltage into current. That's when you generally use that. Okay, moving on now to Kirchhoff's current law. Current law is also called as a junction law. You can notice that there is a junction over here, or you can also call it as a node, node or a basically junction. And this principle of Kirchhoff's current law is simply based on conservation of what guys? Come on, let's see how many of you remember this. Conservation of dash. What is that dash? Because you will see whatever current is going in is equal to the total current which is going out. That is what it is. Because no charge can stay there accumulated. Exactly. It is nothing but conservation of charge. Perfecto. It's conservation of charge. Excellent. So in this particular example, the currents which are going in are I1, I2 and I3. So I1 plus I2 plus I3. Currents which are going out are I4, I5 and I6. That's it. That's Kirchhoff's current law applied. That's KCL for all of you. Next is Kirchhoff's voltage law. What does it tell you and what is it based on? It is based on conservation of potential or basically energy conservation of energy it says that if you start from a point you climb up a hill you go down a hill 
you go up go up go down go up go down and eventually you come back to the same point you will come back to the same voltage or potential so while climbing up the hill is similar to increasing the potential and going down a hill is decreasing the potential so if you measure all the changes oh i increased by plus 7 oh i decreased by 1 oh i increased by 5 oh i decreased by 10 if i add all these increases and decreases with their signs the total change will be zero if i come back to the same point that's all is that clear so the total change of the voltage differences across all the devices when i come back to the same point is going to be zero perfecto perfecto so here is what is going to happen others you are going to block you bacha no use okay i just hidden you in the channel permanently okay so what's this now the sum of all the voltage differences across a loop basically the same point is going to be zero now how do you know which is plus which is minus how which is you know increase which is decrease it's simple observe this carefully first let me just take a cell then let me take a resistor with some current flowing in it and then let me also take a capacitor because these are the only three devices you will be dealing with for Kirchhoff's voltage law there is a positive charge here there is a negative charge here positive negative plates great now observe this first thing in a battery this is low voltage this is high voltage yes or no this is negative this is positive terminal so this is low potential this is high potential just mentally picture as this initially you might write it down also it's okay if you're writing it down in case of a capacitor this is high voltage this is low voltage plus minus so this is high voltage this is low voltage perfect in case of a resistor current goes from always high voltage to low voltage current flows in a resistor always from high voltage to low voltage mentally pictureize this that's all you need now imagine if i am going in a circuit like this tuck, 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 i'm crawling okay i'm crawling in this circuit and i encounter resistor battery capacitor battery capacitor resistor 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 whatever i encounter different things as i crawl i might get higher potential lower potential increase decrease plus minus so if i am crawling and i'm going from here to here in a battery left to right am i not going to a higher voltage so shouldn't the increase be positive plus so here it will be basically plus e so the change in the voltage will be plus e everyone with me similarly if you go or crawl like this from high to low it will be minus e everyone with me understood similarly think and clearly tell me if i go from left to right in this capacitor will it be plus or minus just answer that quickly in the chat box answer that quickly in the chat box guys if i go from plus to minus whether it will be positive or negative it will be minus because i'm going to a lower value if i go from here to here then it will be plus and voltage is always q by c remember that that is the voltage difference q is equal to cv so q by c is the voltage if i go like this if i go like this it will be minus q by c minus q by c is that right perfect here let's see if you guys can answer this now what do you think will be the correct answer if i go from high to low in the resistor case i'm going from high to low negative so hence it will be minus ir whereas if i go from here to here it will be plus ir now isn't it very simple guys everybody understood the logic you cannot forget it if you know which is high which is low where are you going low to high or high to low you know whether it is plus or whether it is minus that's all it takes some time practice it with very lallu laddu simple easy peasy lemon squeezy questions so that you get a hang of the convention then you can solve any question very good kirti
And guys, I hope you are smashing the like button. If you have not done that yet, please do that and make sure you stay subscribed to the channel. Yeah, the number one English channel for NEET. So maybe I can show you some examples. Let's just take a random thing. Imagine a battery, then suddenly coming a resistor, then a capacitor, then branch over here, something like this. Okay, then another battery, and maybe a resistor, and maybe a capacitor, maybe another resistor, like this branch. Okay, let me just assume the currents I1, I1, I2, maybe this is a branch, so I2, okay, this is let's say I3, I3, I3. Okay, I think this is fine. This is E1, this is R1, this is C1, this is R2, this is E2, this is R3, this is uh, C1 is done, okay, this is C2. Okay, let's try to maybe go around this loop and apply KVL, okay, let's just apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. RC circuits is not there, bacha. Yes, the PDF of the uh, uh, entire session will be there in the Telegram channel after few hours, okay. Yes, Laddu versus Beam, Chota, 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 Beam, very good. Others, you have come again. Don't worry, you will get timed out again. Okay, so here it comes. How do we solve this question? First of all, let's start from here. Let's start from here and go like this and come back over here. Don't forget any device and stop here only. Don't stop here or don't stop here. That would be stupidity. First thing, okay, I am getting a capacitor. Maybe this is positive side, this is negative side, maybe this is negative side, this is positive side. I'm just assuming guys, it doesn't matter. First thing that I will get, first thing that I'll get if I go like this and come back this way. First thing, capacitor, right? I'm going from high to low, right? High to low, that means it will be negative, right? So it will be minus Q2 by C2. Everyone? Minus Q2 by C2, perfect. Then I'm getting a resistor. Oh my God, I think I should... I, ask this to be let's say R4 or something maybe okay then it's fine I'm going in the resistor I'm going in the direction of the current current goes from high to low in the resistor so that means I'm going to a lower voltage that means negative so minus I3 R4 here I'm going through a battery this is negative this is positive I'm going from low to high so low to high so plus E1 plus E1 here, I'm going through this resistor. Current is going like this. So, high to low. The current will flow from high to low. So, I'm going negative. So, minus I1 R1. Capacitor. I'm going from low to high. Minus to plus. So, plus positive Q1 by C1. Then, I'm going through this resistor. Here, I'm going from high to low because current flows from high to low voltage. So, negative. So, minus I2 R2. I'm going through a battery, negative to positive, so plus E2. Going from high to low, high to low, current flows from high to low. So therefore, minus I3 R3. I came back to the same point, so hence this should be zero. That's all. Awesome, Prem. Very good. So this is how questions are solved. Let's solve some questions based on this. The figure shows... Currents in part of an electrical circuit, the current I, this current I, come on, com completely based on Kirchhoff's current law. Completely based on Kirchhoff's current law. Hello, Sivagaru. Everyone start answering this. Everybody start answering this. It's a previous year question. Awesome, Kirti. Very good. No problem, Hari Aran. You missed quite a lot. Uh, watch the remaining lecture later on. It will be recorded, obviously. A, is that? Perfect. I think it is A. Very good. Very good, guys. Very good. Proud of all of you. 2 and 2 together will give you 4. This 4 partially will go as 1. The remaining 3 will come here. 3 is coming here. 1.3 is going here. Obviously, remaining 1.7 will come here. That's it. That's the answer. Perfecto. Proud of all of you. Let's see if you guys can solve this question. The question which came in need was just write down the equation, not even solve. Just write down the equation for the loop B, C, D, E, B. This loop, just write down the equation. Come on, let's see if you guys can do it. 
current is going like this, it's going like this, 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 current is going here, coming back. So this is the loop, start from this point and come back to that same point. See what is the equation that will match. Come on, figure this out. Some of you are saying B, is that so? Says Saurya Sharma, B, I don't know. We'll figure it out. If I start from here, the first thing I get is a resistance and I'm going from high to low, current flows from high to low. So minus I2, I2. Then I go through the battery. This is positive, this is negative. High to low, that means negative. So minus E2. Here I'm going from negative to positive, so I'm climbing up. So plus E3. Here I'm going from, oh, this is low, this is high because current is going from higher voltage to lower voltage. I am crawling up. So this will be plus I3 R1. I came back to the same point, it is zero. So minus I2 R2 is not there exact. Oh, it's there, but plus E2. Okay, this is plus E2. Okay, so I multiply this with minus one. Multiply this with minus one. What are you going to get guys? This will be I2 R2 plus E2 plus, oh sorry, this will become minus now. This will become minus E3. This will become minus I3 R1 is zero. Just check this out. Is that right? So is such an option there? Yes, it is as option B. Perfect. Perfect. So you had to multiply it with minus one only then you get the correct answer or else you will be like nothing is matching. Something is wrong. Many people got scared. But actually, it was easy. Just had to multiply. Awesome. Moving on to another question. What is the voltage difference between this point and this point? Current flowing is 2 amperes. Resistance and batteries are given. What is the voltage difference between the two ends? Okay, I think it is not that difficult. If you visualize, the current is going like this. Current goes from high to low. High to low. So basically there will be a drop. How much will be the drop? IR. What is I? I is basically 2. R is basically 2, so it will be 4 volts decrease, drop, that is understood. Okay. Here, I am going from high to low, again there is a drop, how much drop? 3 volts. Okay. Again the same current will flow, right? The same current, it is in series. How much will be the drop again? It will be I into R, what is current? 1, what is R? 1, so it is basically 1 volt. So 4 volts, 3 volts and 1 volt, so guys, what is the? total drop of the voltage across the entire thing 4 plus 3 plus 1 if 1 was drop 1 was increased then I'll put plus minus here everything is dropping so just add their drops that's all cumulative effect so it is going to be 8 volts it's going to be 8 volts uh, oh sorry I made a mistake the current was not 1 I'm so sorry guys the current was not 1 it was 2 so sorry the current was 2. I took it as 1. My bad. So this is 2 into 1. So 2 volts. So this will be 4 plus 3 plus 2. So this is just going to be 9 volts. Okay. That's the answer. That's the answer. Perfect. When did I start the live? Hari Haran. I started at 6 o'clock. So usually I post uh, what I'm going to do in the next few days on the Telegram channel. And when you're subscribed, you also get notifications and you can see it in the upcoming sessions when you open your YouTube app and hit the subs uh, subscription uh, mode or whatever uh, tab. So you can see the upcoming classes. So generally, that's the best way to uh, keep a track of all my sessions through Telegram and through subscriptions. Okay. So that was the answer. Moving on to the last part of the chapter. Clear O, clear O, clear O. Okay. So now the last part is all about a measuring uh, instrument which is called as a potentiometer. And that potentiometer helps us to find either the voltage drop or to compare the battery or to even find the internal resistance of a battery. So it's a very versatile device. You can use it in three different ways. Voltage, compare the EMF, or even internal resistance. But it is bulky, it is heavy, 
it is complex in the sense that you have to do many things it's not like you just connect and like okay value is shown no you have to calculate so it is little bit laborious but if you get the hang of it that's it it's very accurate device you always make use of a galvanometer to basically uh, measure anything like the one which you used in meter bridge galvanometer is the one which gets deflected when current passes through it no current no deflection reverse the current the uh, deflection also reverses so this is a basic setup of a potentiometer experiment generally this is the potentiometer wire of certain length l the wire is connected to a battery and maybe even some resistance over here could be internal resistance or just an external resistance doesn't matter maybe i'll just call it as r this wire itself has some potential difference or sorry has some resistance rw this is usually called as the driving circuit or primary circuit because that's where the main battery is connected there is some resistance there is a wire you know the length you know the resistance of the wire everything so what happens is forget this part of the circuit there will be some current flowing in the circuit like this this current is basically i and you can easily find out that current it's not so difficult logic forget the top circuit it is not even relevant right now it will be the total emf by total resistance in this case the total emf is e the total resistance is that internal external resistance plus the resistance of that wire yes or no i is equal to e by total resistance i hope this is clear why are you going to teach english for boards i don't know i don't have an answer for that yeah you should tell me i should not teach kya if you don't want me to teach fine i'll not teach i thought it will be helpful like i thought of helping you guys i mean if you don't want help okay fine then next day you will say anu sir why are you teaching physics now for boards fine i'll not teach boards physics then you will come sir why are you teaching neat physics teach only je physics fine i'll teach only je physics like this oh my god okay so this is the current now the next thing that is important is basically you know you have to find the voltage difference across the terminals of the wire and divided by the length that gives you how much is the voltage per unit length voltage gradient so the next part is basically voltage gradient this is generally required for solving potentiometer problems it is delta v by the length delta v will be the same current whatever you find found out the same current into the resistance of that wire the resistance of that wire divided by the length of that wire that's it i hope this is clear everyone with me yes uh, capacitor blocks the flow of the current after it is charged i think i told it at the beginning only okay semiconductor is already done jayashri please watch it watch the previous videos on modern physics playlist now this voltage gradient is same everywhere in the wire this voltage per unit length this much voltage per unit length this voltage per unit length it's the same if i take some two random points on that wire let's say separated by an amount of x then the voltage difference across those two points the voltage difference across those two points if i call it delta v and if i divide by the separation between them which is x that will also be equal to nothing but this i into rw by l is that that right guys this i into rw by l now what is the advantage of this what is the advantage of this observe now carefully now this is the most important formula which i got imagine i have some circuit some random circuit there is some device fan washing machine tv whatever i take one wire here i take another wire here connected to this potentiometer primary driving circuit i connect it to a galvanometer i adjust this point to such a location that the galvanometer does not deflect what is happening the galvanometer is not deflecting very very important null deflection there is null deflection if there is null deflection that means current through the galvanometer is zero if no current is coming in no current is going out there is no current here also 
there is no current here there is no current here oh when can that happen when the voltage across these two points is the voltage across these two points voltage across these two points is voltage across these two points hence the voltage across this particular resistor the voltage across this particular resistor or device is equal to delta v which in turn is this which in turn is this i i can find out r is given length is given that's it you get the answer is that clear is that understood my dear students everybody with me so this is how you can uh, find out the voltage difference between two points which is also equal to the voltage across that device and everything else over here is known you can measure x l is given resistance of the wire is given everything is given to you what is driving voltage is the voltage which drives the circuit this is that emf e is called as a driving voltage that's all now you can use it to measure the uh, voltage just like i showed it to you over here so put i in fact this slide i should have shown it here but it's okay so one use is using it like a voltmeter so using it like a voltmeter so this voltage across the resistor which is delta v is equal to this entire thing this entire thing which is basically x into i into basically the remaining things over here r w by l r w by l so that is the formula which will give you the voltage of that uh, resistor as a voltmeter the second application is to compare the batteries you take one battery connect it first time forget the second one keep it open then find the balancing length let's say it comes out to be l1 so l1 is nothing but the balancing length balancing length balancing length for null deflection for null deflection with only e1 only e1 is connected that's all l2 is the same thing balancing length with only e2 you measure l1 measure l2 the ratio will be e1 by e2 if you know e1 you can find e2 if you know e2 you can find e1 so you can compare or basically find the emf assuming you know the emf of the other cell that's all so for this question this formula applicable how we recognize vaishnavi it will be generally given that find the potential gradient or potentiometer setup is connected to this circuit what is the voltage drop across the battery or sorry what is the voltage drop across the device they will directly give you application oriented question what is the voltage drop across it or what is the potential gradient they will directly give you what is the potential gradient sometimes they will give you this circuit or they will say for comparing emfs a potentiometer circuit is used the first time the balancing length was 20 cm second time it was 30 cm the ratio of the emf will be 20 by 30 which is 2 by 3 that's all okay i hope this is clear i hope that is done all right abhinandan that's because in a capacitor is charged there is no further need of charge so that's it it blocks it it's done it's charged no further charge will grow so it will block but in ac first it will charge this way then the uh, direction of the current will reverse so it will again get discharged and it will again get charged in the reverse way then again the current direction will change so again it will get discharged and again it will get charged in the other way so basically it allows current to flow in ac next last application is to find internal resistance of a battery so in such cases what you do is you don't take a external resistance just connect the battery and see what is the balancing length so that is basically l1 so it is basically balancing length balancing length with only the cell only the cell that's it that is l1 now you take some other resistance external resistance and now find the new balancing length so that is basically l2 that is basically the balancing length that's a balancing length with external resistance r that's over here measure l1 measure l2 l1 by l2 minus 1 into r will give you the internal resistance so this internal resistance over here you will get it using this formula 
So that's the third application of your potentiometer setup. All the three you should know. It's very simple. First is basically as a voltmeter using voltage gradient. Second thing is by comparing EMFs, take the ratio of the lens. Third one, first connect the battery, measure the length. Next, connect the battery with another resistance, measure the length. Ratio of the lens minus one into R is going to give you internal resistance. Let's do some questions, maybe you'll get it. A battery, a resistor and a wire, all are in series. Resistance is 10. Potential gradient is how much? Okay, let's try to solve. Exactly, Susanta, that's what we are trying to do now. So imagine there is this potentiometer wire. It is connected to a resistor and then a battery like this. The wire is having a length of 2 meters and the resistance is 10 ohms. This is 10 ohms. External resistance 990 ohms. Battery voltage 2 volts. First things first, what will be the current flowing in the circuit? Without the current, I cannot do anything else. So the current will be the voltage divided by total resistance, which is 990 plus 10, which is 2 by 1000, right? 2 by, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, that's correct. 2 by 1000. Perfect. Everyone fine till this point? What's next? What's next? Ha, huh, meter bridge is done, bacha. Meter bridge is done. What's next? Once I know the current, in order to find the voltage per unit length or the gradient, the voltage gradient, I will take the voltage across these two points, voltage across the wire, voltage across the wire, and divide it by the length of the wire. Voltage of the wire is current into resistance of that wire, current into resistance of the wire. What is the current? It is basically 2 by 1000. What is the resistance of the wire? It is 10. What is the length of the wire? It is 2. 2, 2 cancels, 1, 0 goes. I'm just left with 10 to the power minus 2 volts per meter. 10 to the power minus 2 volts per meter. Just check this out. Yes, option C is correct. 10 to the power minus 2 is 0 0.01. Perfect. So finding current, finding voltage. Voltage by length is voltage gradient. Simple. Let's do one more question on this. In the diagram, this wire has a resistance of 5 ohm. This entire wire. This entire wire. Okay. It has a resistance of 5 ohms and length of 10 meters in total. The balancing length, how much is this length if this EMF is 0.4 volt? I think it's performing the job of a voltmeter, of a job of a voltmeter. Very, very crucial. So whatever voltage is over here, which is 0.4 volts, is also the voltage over here, 0.4 volts. The problem is, I do not know this length. How much is this length? I really do not know. I want to find that out. Okay. Same logic like before. Start with finding the current. There is a battery. The current will flow like this through all these elements this way. Just show that. There will be some current flowing through it. That current will be the voltage divided by total resistance. 45 and this whole resistance of the green part wire is 5 so it will be 45 plus 5 which is 5 by 50 which is basically 0.1 ampere first thing next thing voltage gradient potential gradient so potential gradient is basically how much is the voltage across this voltage across ab upon the length of ab voltage of ab is i into r is I into R upon length of AB. Current, I know, is 0.1. Resistance is 5 ohms. And length is 10 meters. Correct, guys? That is what it is. So, this will just become 5 into 10 to the power minus 2 volts per meter. Once I know this, I know the last step will be this volts, if it is there per meter, so 0.4 volts is there for how many meters? 0.4 volts is there for how many meters? So that's it. This will be 0.4 divided by x. 0.4 divided by x. Therefore, x will be equal to 5 into 10 to the power minus 2 divided by 0.4. What is the final answer?
वॉट इज दर गाइस यप परफेक्ट ओ दिस इज गोइंग टू बी दिस इज गोइंग टू बी हाउ मच ओ सॉरी आई डिड अ मिस्टेक ओवर हियर आई एम सो सॉरी गाइस I had to put it exactly opposite. <laughs> yeah, so x will be basically 0.4 divided by 5 into 10 to the power minus 2. So this will be 4 t into 10 to the power minus 2 divided by 5 into 10 to the power minus 2. 10 to the power minus 2. 10 to the power minus 2 cancels. 40 by 5 is 8. So 8 meters is the answer. That's all. So that's the way to solve it. Like I told you, it is little laborious. It is time consuming. but they are very good instruments they are very accurate instruments potentiometer it is also versatile you can use it as a voltmeter comparing emfs and internal resistance directly formula based if you solve few problems you'll get a hang of it else you'll lose marks generally they give some questions on potentiometer so glad kv santosh you enjoyed it so that brings us to the end of the class and yep what a fantastic class we did this class for 3 hours straight and i hope you guys enjoyed it and you are showing your affection and love by not just liking and subscribing but i also want to comment saying capacitors and current electricity done and dusted that's the word there's a comment that you're going to put in and you can put some hearts you can put some smiley or if you want to ask me something please feel free to ask even our community is very strong of more than 1 lakh 20000 need aspirants learn uh, wanting to learn in english so they will also help you so stay motivated help each other let's grow this community this is your channel this is not my channel this is your channel remember that you should feel belonged over here help each other stay tuned i'll be coming tomorrow for the english session and day after tomorrow for the practice questions maybe of english and the telegram channel link is there in the description box radha okay so if you have not yet seen it please uh, check it out right over here as you're watching this come on guys smash the like button if you're not done that is right over here okay these are the playlists and uh, you can see the crash courses telegram channel right over here join the vedantu neat english telegram channel just click on this it will open up all the pdfs updates everything right over there thank you very much do not forget to post your comment saying done and dusted chemistry uh, sorry what is this uh, current electricity and capacitors i would be seeing even if you're watching it recorded i would see it okay thank you bye bye have a great time lovely dinner assalamu alaikum this is captain shreyas and i'm signing off bye bye